We made this. everyone and welcome to the xcast the truth is in here my name is Kurt off and welcome along to our season seven coverage of the x files and uh joining me today is darren mooney darren how are you doing today mate i'm good i'm good i'm really enjoying this place that i've committed myself to for observation it's been a very busy couple of weeks for you know not to date the podcast but anybody listening will know that i spent two weeks in the you know irish the dublin international film festival i watched 60 films over the space of 12 days then i came out and then it was the oscar nominations it was the snyder cut review day it was the snyder cut release day it was falcon and the winter soldier it was saint patrick's day so i'm I'm just like recovering now i'm I'm enjoying it kind of check myself in voluntarily and i'm I'm hoping that everything will work itself out well, I have been doing some incantations. I am the life here that lived with me <laughs> yet shall I live and i've re have re reanimated you, so hopefully we'll be all right so yeah. uh listeners will be reassured to know that he's using salt, not the no, other stuff, not no, the other def- stuff. <laughs> <laughs> definitely not the other stuff uh yeah i, I have no, no no animals have been harmed in this uh in this uh, reanimation that's all i'll say uh yeah so we are talking about the x-files episode millennium and uh that was season seven episode four it was written by vince gilligan and frank frank spotnitz and it was directed by who was it directed by thomas, thomas j wright, j. wright, j. wright yeah. which the is right interesting and it's interesting in itself um which we'll get into so yeah let's uh, let's dive straight into this we've got a big mailbag because not only is it an x-file episode it also involves a character called frank black from the millennium universe which of course i've been covering over on the times now and uh, you've been helping me with that darren over the over the three seasons so we've got um we've got help is one word for it uh, well (laughs) yeah uh help 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 and more help and um, yeah, so we've got a couple of things, a couple of mailbags in there. And there's quite a lot of comments from varying different angles, as you can yes. imagine. Yeah. So, um, so yeah. So what do you make to this X-File episode? Yeah. This X-File <laughs> episode. From that sense. Well, you know, I mean, look, I was watching the X-Files. I was like, who the hell is this Frank Black character? Why do I care about him? Why are we spending so much time with him? Let's get to the real action, the Mulder and Scully kiss at the climax. That's what this is all about as an X-Files fan. That's kind of what we're preoccupied with. That's what the whole episode's building to. Also, there's some stuff involving zombies, but like primarily it's the turn of the millennium, Mulder and Scully kiss, and they walk off stage, you know, Mulder's hand draped around Scully. That's really what you know millennium is about from an x-files perspective i think you know if we're actually grading it as an x-files episode it's very disjointed it's very uneven like a lot of seven season episodes now i again this is probably a bit unfair and a bit reductive but i think when you hit the seven season the x-files i really like the sixth season i I think we've talked before when i was on with carl um i didn't get to cover any of the x-files light stuff which is a shame because i love the x-files light Uh, i also obviously love the vancouver era as well because everybody does love that era too but i think that you know the sixth season had this burst of energy that kind of carried it through its earlier weirder episodes and those earlier weirder episodes kind of fit with the show moving from vancouver to los angeles so no real problem with the sixth season i think when you hit the seventh season you reach a point where everybody is exhausted. And again, like it's worth stressing, like when people talk about that, this is, and again, this is something that comes up when you talk about behind the scenes stuff in the X-Files in general. When you talk about, say, how tense on-set relations were between actors. Like making a show like the X-Files is insane. Making a show like the X-Files with two featured leads rather than a large ensemble that you can rotate through in order to spread the workload is completely bonkers. Making a show like that in Los Angeles, where the cast and crew are now confined by A, everything being much more expensive to shoot, and B, it taking much longer to commute to anything that isn't the immediate surroundings of Los Angeles. Um, you, You have this kind of sense of, this is a really tough show to make. So I think when you hit the seventh season, and I don't 
I hope I'm not being harsh and I hope I'm not being unfair. And I will be clear, there are absolute masterpieces um, in the seventh season. I think like X-Cops, for example, is one of the best episodes of not just of the X-Files, but of television that was produced in the 90s. Like, mm. so I'm not I'm not trashing the entire season. But I think that when you get to the seventh season, there is a sense of fatigue and exhaustion and a why are we doing this? This is the last year. We're going to finish up, right? We're wrapping. We're putting a bow on everything. We just want to, like, dot all the I's and cross all the T's. And again, maybe if I'm back later in the season, we'll talk about why that didn't happen. But, like, watching episodes like Millennium, it really does feel like the show has reached a point where everybody's just like, well, look, we did it. It was the biggest show on television. It was one of the biggest shows of the 90s. It was a cultural phenomenon. We had a blockbuster movie. We've done the two seasons in los angeles where david duchovny gets to be in los angeles and also where everybody gets paid a little bit more because it's a network hit and we extended our five-year contract can we finish up now can we wrap up and with millennium as an episode of the x-files you really see that sense of well are we done yet to it because it's like yeah we're bringing in frank black from the tv show millennium in order to tie up the x-files and millennium together we we intimated that the shows existed in the same universe uh in the early first season episode of millennium lamentation we used Mulder and scully's stand-ins uh, in the distance to suggest that they all existed in the same world in the second season we brought in the character of jose chung from jose chung's from outer space to do the episode jose chung's doomsday defense and actually if you haven't watched if you're listening on the x-cast and you haven't watched an episode of millennium that's probably as good a jumping in place as any because you have the character of Jose Jung to guide you over. And I mean, it got a bit thorny in the third season of Millennium in, uh, was it Closure or Nostalgia? I think it's Closure, where like they're watching Kill Switch on television. Yeah. So that, that implies that like there's a TV show, The X-Files, in the world of Millennium, but Millennium is also in the same world of The X-Files. So there's a TV show of The X-Files in the world of The X-Files. And I feel like we didn't explore that enough and we need to dive into that, but we don't have time. But yeah, the, the sense of like bringing in Frank Black in Millennium, it's like, yeah, he was a 1013 character. Millennium was a show that was very important to Chris Carter and will continue to be. I think in 2012, when Carter... I think it was the some sort of was it Los Angeles Television Film Festival something like that. He was asked to pick. He was asked to pick something to screen, um, and I think he picked an episode of the X Files. I think it was probably Postmodern Prometheus. But he also picked the pilot of Millennium to air. I think Carter's always been very proud of Millennium. It's always meant something important to him. And again, I think that bringing Frank Black into the X Files is a way of saying. Well, look, you know, Millennium maybe didn't register on the cultural you know, scale in the way that I intended it to. The pilot was absolutely massive, but viewership declined sharply across the you know, three seasons that aired. So putting Frank Black on the X-Files is a way of saying Millennium mattered. Millennium was important. Millennium is part of this world. And so that's kind of like it feels like closing a book in that sense. And then obviously the big kiss at the end as well, because, you know, if this was the final season, of the X-Files and a lot of interviews around the time with people like, say, Vince Gilligan suggests that the writers for at least the first half of the season were operating on the sense that this was going to be the final season, most obvious in the kind of like closure and sign on Z two barter where the show is like, yeah, we kind of need to deal with this before we end. And here you have Mulder and Scully kissing because obviously a large part of the tension of the X-Files has been from the start, the question for shippers of whether or not Mulder and Scully are going to get together. And here I managed to enrage every X-Cast listener by reminding everybody that I'm a shipping agnostic. I'm neither a shipper nor a no-romo. I think that, you know, if Mulder and Scully get together, that's grand as long as it's written well. I think if they don't get together, that's also grand as long as that's written well either. Uh, but I do think that like Mulder and Scully kissing is very much something that you have to change check off the bucket list and again like last season you had two fathers one son which was like look we know that the feature film didn't actually wrap up any of the mythology or conspiracy stuff so we're gonna do a mea culpa and we're gonna say look we'll wrap up some of the mythology and conspiracy stuff and millennium where Mulder and scholar kiss is very much like okay yeah we know the cock blocking b was a bit much in fight the future we'll say we'll put our hands up and say okay we didn't give you what you wanted finally Mulder and Scully are going to kiss. And so it does have that sense of, well, look, we're tidying up loose ends. I just really wish it were a better episode of television. And I wish there were a bit more energy to it. I wish it was a bit more inspired in how and why it was doing the things that it felt the need to do, if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah, it does. Yeah, it's uh, well put. And uh, for, for an early season seven episode as well, you know, it's... Uh... Good to get your your thoughts on it, and I know, I know that we'll, zombies will will kind of reappear 
um, as we as we get through the season as well. And I know that you've written about that in on, on several occasions about you know this season feeling like that, which is always good to look at. I mean, this episode in particular. Um, now, the, the the word discussions about whether or not it should be more millennium focused, or should it be an X, should it be millennium in an X file world? I mean, it it is an interesting thing that you know. Uh, for those people who are, who are listening to the that haven't seen the the finale of Millennium, effectively Frank goes and drives off into the sunset. A glorious sunset yeah. with uh, with Jordan after seeing um, what plans were laid out for him, and um, you know he, he basically just runs away and uh, and that's that's how he's how he's left, and he's left in a really nice you know the the season itself wasn't actually going to be. Um, was wasn't announced to be the finale until the I think it was around either the day or maybe even slightly after or just slightly before the the showing of the episode. So it was opened for interpretation for a season four. So they left it a really nice place and could have just left it at that, but it felt that they needed to bring Frank Black in, and there was this a discussion had whether or not it should be a a, a heavy Millennium fe- featured episode or it should be. Uh, an X Files World um, episode. Now you, you've alluded to some of the aspects of it, but um, I think that they probably did go the right way. I do, but I'm similar to you. I'm not as um, I'm not as convinced it was um, written the best for both. It wasn't the best of both worlds, effectively. Um, so, what are your thoughts on that? And then, what would you rate this out of ten? Yeah, I mean, again, like this is the thing where I think Spotnitz has said, I think in Back to Frank Black, he said that one of his big regrets in writing the episode, and we should probably actually acknowledge this from the outset, the episode is written by uh, two thirds of the John Gilnitz team by uh, Vince Gilligan and Frank Spotnitz. And that's an interesting choice uh, to write the Millennium episode. Spotnitz, to his credit, had written episodes for the first and third season of Millennium. He'd done his work on the show. Um, So he was familiar with the character Frank Black and the world of Millennium. However, Spotnitz was never a driving creative force on Millennium. He's intimated, uh, I think, on the DVD special features that he was considered to take over the running of Millennium in its second season when Fox basically said, look, Chris, you're doing Fight the Future and you're making the X-Files. You need to focus your energies here. You can't do run two shows and make a feature film and do everything that that involves. So you need to step back from one of them. And it's probably going to be Millennium because Fox is very much invested in the X-Files. Um, and obviously Morgan and Wong would come in and would run the show after their kind of like departure from the X-Files uh, in the second season, their return in the fourth season. And their again, departure at the end of the fourth season to do as uh, the Notorious Seven, uh, which it wasn't picked up and then kind of came back and ran the second season Millennium. But it feels odd that like Carter picked out of a lineup Spotnitz, who again, really good writer, really trusted writer. Nobody knows more about the world of the X Files apart from Chris Carter than Frank Spotnitz. So, you know, and, and he's written some Millennium, but not a lot of it. And then you have Vince Gilligan, who, who has never written an episode of Millennium. Now, to be fair to Gilligan, he's talked in interviews about how much he loves Millennium. And I don't think that's pure, um, I don't think that's like pure puff or pure advertising reading Gilligan's comments it's very clear that he actually watched the show and has thoughts about it he's talked about how like for example the first season millennium inspired him when he was doing Breaking Bad to add more comedy um, or add more dark comedy to the drama because like as much as he loved the first season millennium it was very very heavy going and I have a like I have a personal pet theory that I have no basis in fact for that if you look at Gilligan's work on the early fourth season of uh, the X-Files, like say on Rue um, and yeah. also Paper Hearts, Gilligan very much seems to be pitching X-Files episodes that could also be Millennium episodes yeah. and that they're stories about profiling serial killers and they just happen to have a supernatural element kind of layered on top. So I, I, I buy that Gilligan was interested in it. It just seems odd that it's like we're putting a cherry on top of like this show that ran for three seasons and we're going to bring in a writer who has never worked on the show or with the characters. And it's particularly odd because like later in the seventh season, you have like Chip Johannesson writing Orison, The Return of Donny Faster. And like that makes us like, uh, you know, like you're going to talk about Orison later in the year. I don't want to derail this by talking about Orison. Orison is an episode that has a large number of problems, but it also like is an episode that 
you know, has interesting ideas and arguably is very millenniumistic, as it were, because yeah. you have, you know, the, the return of Donny Faster, Donny Faster in the second season in Irresistible. Most people point to Irresistible as like ground zero for the evolution of Millennium as like something that grew out of the X-Files and became Millennium. So you can kind of see Johannesson writing the return of Donny Faster as like, well, this is the spiritual endpoint of Millennium. But you do wonder why they didn't bring in Johannesson, who had written episodes for all three seasons of Millennium and who had served as showrunner during the second half or in fact, final two thirds of the third season of Millennium and had a strong idea of what it was doing and why. It's a very strange choice in terms of writing. And, you know, I can see why you would want this to be an X-Files episode. I can see why you wouldn't want to give Mulder and Scully the week off, even though obviously like, you know, Gillian Anderson and David Duchovny at this point would probably appreciate a week off. I can see why you wouldn't want viewers tuning into your episode going, who's this Frank Black character? Why do I care? I'm here for Mulder and Scully. And I do wonder if, like, there was something very cynical in the choice to make this the episode with the kiss, uh, because it's like, well, you know, Mulder and Scully fans now have to watch this episode, <laughs> yeah. um, no matter how much Millennium stuff we put in there. And, like, we'll probably talk about it when we get to talk about the episode proper, but it's a really weird payoff. If you look at it from the perspective of Millennium, if you've been following Millennium, if you've been watching Millennium, this is a very strange payoff. I imagine people who hadn't been watching Millennium are very confused by like the episode and the stakes and the logic and the world. And I want to assure those people who have never watched Millennium and are big X-Files fans, Millennium fans are just as confused by the stakes and the logic and the world. Like the stuff that happens in this episode is not really indicative of Millennium as a TV show. I would argue Orison is, is more indicative of Millennium as a TV show, but obviously going back to things like Grotesque or Irresistible. So it's a very, very, very strange choice. And I mean, yeah, we'll probably talk a bit more when we actually get into discussions of it. But even the little things like you mentioned the, the fact that like the third season of Millennium ends with like Frank Black and Jordan literally riding off to the horizon together, like venturing out into the world and kind of like trying to find their space in it. So it's really, really weird where this episode of The X-Files, which is nominally also a conclusion to Millennium, starts. It doesn't start where Millennium ended. It like rewinds slightly, zips off in another direction, adds a bunch of exposition does a bunch of stuff that theoretically for people watching Millennium are hugely important thematically and in terms of like continuity and does them in a few throwaway lines. And it's like, no, 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 this character who you followed through Millennium starts in a completely different place than he ended Millennium, which is yeah. slightly frustrating if you're watching it as a, like a coda or a conclusion. Sorry, I have very strong opinions about this. Um, you do. Um, but the thing is, I'll, I'll get back to your rating in a second. It's one of a couple of things I want to mention. <clears throat> Excuse me. So first up, um, it's almost just while you were speaking there, I was thinking about the end of, of Millennium, the episode, uh, uh, the Goodbye to All Art, which was the season end, the season three end. And uh, it's almost as if like Frank takes Jordan out of school, goes straight to hospital, straight to a psychiatric hospital, spends yeah. 30 days in there. Then has his uh, then has his little trip with Mulder and Scully, and yeah. then ends up in the car at the end. Yeah, no, like <laughs> so, that would make more sense. That would actually make more sense if it was structured that way. If this was all like an interquell, um, although that would mean that like when he left the hospital, presumably at like two minutes to midnight, it was also a beautiful sunset outside. <laughs> well, that's true. That's true. Yeah, yeah, but with with Millennium and Chip, uh, anything's possible. Yeah, that's fair. Um, but also as well, um, a couple of things that. Just within the, within the mailbag, Katie Doll actually said, um, "It's a, this episode in particular, the X File one, is an episode I don't rewatch unless I'm going to all the way through. I don't have a connection to the Millennium storyline, but zombies really freak me out, and I'm not a huge fan of the Kiss. Not an episode for me." But she does. Um, Tony steps in and talks about, "I think you'd really enjoy Millennium because Katie's into like Twin Peaks and the like." And she says, if it's streaming somewhere, I would give it a shot. After hearing for so long how it's much darker than X Files, I never had a desire to watch it. If there if there are more zombies, I'm out. And that's the particular <laughs> yeah. thing is that this doesn't equate to what Millennium is. And but yet, you know, there some are people, no it, zombies in Millennium. There are yeah. no like spoiler alert in case you're like in case you're thinking about watching Millennium. I hate to spoil it for you, but there are no zombies in the show. <laughs> yeah. So that's it. That's interesting in itself. So I just wanted to, why you were talking about that. It came to mind <laughs> that Katie had said that. 
But um, but yeah, finally, let's go to rating then. Let's go to IMDb and let's go to what you think of this episode as a rating. Would you are you able to even pass that? Bearing in mind that it is a mixture of everything. <laughs> Yeah, this is the thing. Okay, so we're going to do crazy number games. I have no basis for this. I don't know. We're jumping ahead. I don't know what the benchmark is for the seventh season of The X-Files in terms of ratings. I have done some Millennium coverage with Kurt for the third season. I know that like the final episode there only got like a hundred odd votes. So I, you know, I suspect that's going to jump significantly because The X-Files is a much bigger show. I think, you know, you'll get the Millennium fans who might vote it up because it features Frank Black, even though... I think a lot of Millennium fans are also like, eh, eh. Uh, but I think like it being like Frank Black, it's like there's a bit of like, he's our guy. We're going to root for him. And being honest, he is our guy. I am going to root for him. Um, so I suspect it might get a little boy for that. I also think the shippers are going to love it because of the kiss, because it's important. Um, and because Carter being Carter made them wait seven years uh, for it, because of course he did. So I think this is probably going to score somewhere around... 8.1 not far off not far off at all it's a uh, dead on eight. Oh, yeah damn it. from 2526 now bearing in mind that as you say millennium got 192 <laughs> people <laughs> voted um now we've discussed millennium um, yeah. on the time is now and the, the voting and chris knows thinks that at one point the, the slate was wiped clean at one point but it's it is a a, a, a different type of show. It's a cult show. It's not. It's not what X Files. You know the the sheer behemoth that X Files had. So or even still has because it was like X Files was remastered for HD. It's now streaming on like Stars on Disney Plus in the UK. Millennium is not. I think even like the DVDs are out of print. Like if you want to watch Millennium, it takes an incredible amount of hard work. If you want to watch the X Files, you can watch it on Amazon Prime here in the UK. You can watch it on Disney Plus. Like it's it's readily available even now, twenty years after. So yeah, no, it's 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 a different ball game. It is absolutely. Um, what about your personal rating then? You, you, I think you're skirting around it, Darren. I, I am <laughs> skirting around it. I mean, probably a three, <laughs> right. which okay. is very low. I know, and I feel really bad because I'm like I'm gonna I'm trying to say some nice stuff. I'll try to say some nice stuff, but yeah, it's a three. I'm afraid. Sorry. Okay. okay. I, I, I'm not as um, as bad as that. I, I think I, I would probably, uh, I think, given the Frank thing, I'd probably say... <laughs> he is uh, our guy. I, yeah, he is our guy. It's a six and a half for me. It, it's uh, bearing in mind that, you know, uh, well, going back to the whole Millennium thing, I know that we obviously we'll keep jumping back to this, that I would very rarely, I vote very similar to the way IMDb scores uh, I think that 10, 13 shows generally yeah. um, are a six to 10 full stop. And six is quite low for me. It's above average. It's all right. Um, for for example, I'm not a huge fan of the new Folk and a Winter Soldier, which just came out this week at time recording. Uh, I gave that a six out of 10. So it's like, it it does. It it didn't, um, it didn't worry me. It didn't, um, yeah, I didn't think it was bad. But there is an episode of 1013, which is the 13 years later, which is uh, an episode which involves Kiss, which is probably the worst episode of all time of, of 1013. If not television as a medium. Yes. Um, I think I, I, I gave, gave that a I four. Gave it, I gave it a two out of ten. <laughs> yeah, I and think I, stra- yeah. I Ironically, my, my, my other half was watching, um, has been re-watching Ugly Betty, and Gene Simmons is on it. And I was like, oh. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, no, it's reminding me of Millennium. Leave me alone. Uh, so I gave that a two out of ten. So, yeah. But um, but let's let's jump into this this episode then. Let's uh, let's start from the beginning, see where we where we end up, and uh, and uh, let's do go and do that now. What do you think to this op- these these openings? Because I think the to be fair that the the first part of it is actually quite a strong, effective. Um, teaser for a start. It's very kind of irresistible. It's kind of yeah. you mentioned irresistible before. It kind of calls back to that a little bit. The zombies. Uh, well, he's not even a zombie yet, but he's very blue and he's very grey. Um, and just the general choice of the kind of type of zombie that they've gone for in this episode. I think um, just the start is what do you make to to all of that. Well, I mean, yeah, again, like there is something very irresistible in it. I mean, Mark Johnson is a death fetishist. Um, Thank you, Broadcast Standards and Practices for that. In that, like, again, even when Frank profiles him later on, he talks about how he's been around death all his life and we see him as a taxidermist and that sort of stuff. And again, 
that aspect of the episode makes sense because it's like, yeah, the millennium really kind of originated or Carter's kind of pointed to it originating in the script for Irresistible. So it makes sense that that's kind of where we'd end up. And it is kind of creepy. It is atmospheric. The cell phone in the coffin is a really lovely touch. It's like, and again, it's one of those things that is like proper good X-Files horror because, you know, that like famous buried alive thing where they would tie a string to the toe and it would ring a bell in the graveyard (laughs) uh, because people are so afraid of being buried alive. It's like the 21st century version of that because, of course, the X-Files is a show with cell phones. So I I really actually really love that idea. That moment is fantastic as well. If we're talking about the zombies, the zombies are interesting. Um, And you, you alluded to it earlier if you wanted to get all artsy fartsy and let me put on some sort of critic hat, I don't know what a critic hat looks like. So listeners will have to imagine it with their, their mental eye. I really don't want it to be a fedora, maybe a top hat or like a cap or a, like a beret or something, whatever it is, I'm wearing it now. Um, but it's not a fedora, but I'm wearing it now anyway. And I think you could make the argument and it's probably a stretch throughout the seventh season there is this recurring fixation with zombies. And it first happens, I think, in Amor Fati, the season premiere, where, like, the body is, like, brought back from the dead in the camp on the coast. Is it the Ivory Coast? I think it is. Where, yeah. like, a zombie comes back from the dead. I think it's Michael Enson and, and kind of tries to attack people. And, like, Vince Gilligan's original draft of the script for Hungry wasn't about Shark Boy. It was about a boy turning into a zombie. Here in Millennium, you have actual literal zombies. One of the big ideas that was pitched through the seventh season was the return of Stephen King, who had obviously written Chinga in the fifth season. He was going to come back and do an adaptation of George Romero's uh, Night of the Living Dead for the X-Files as well. Mm-hmm. And like again, when you go beyond that, you even look at things like, say, David Duchovny's Hollywood AD, in which like the X-Files movie is a zombie movie. And if you wanted to extrapolate and generalize and like, again, it's also worth pointing out that, uh, again, mild spoilers. I don't know how many people are watching the show for the first time along with us. So I'm going to keep this vague. But guys who people who know, you know, in the eighth season, there will be a retroactive piece of continuity that affects the seventh season, revealing that a major character was arguably the walking dead for a significant stretch of the season it's one of the clumsiest retcons in the eighth season and i love the eighth season so much but again there's this sense of like the walking dead permeating the seventh season and part of me wonders like is this the show dealing with the fact that it is itself arguably the walking dead it's kind of shuffling along and i think i probably talked about this with um kind of carl when i talked about the sixth season finale and the seventh season premiere even the mythology when you get to the seventh season is an ambling zombie like because most of the big characters are dead all the elders are dead the conspiracy has largely been dismantled the colonists appear to be no longer collaborating with them anyway but they're still like operating call centers there are still people picking up phones there's like a weird moment in amorpha tea where there are like cops and doctors hanging around like actors just waiting for stuff to do between takes because the mythology and conspiracy is just kind of spinning its wheels at this point and again you could arguably read that as a metaphor for a show that many people expected to end this season and again it's worth pointing out The reason why so many network shows, uh, say, think of all these Star Trek shows from the 90s, Star Trek Next Generation, Star Trek Deep Space Nine, Star Trek Voyager. The reason why those shows tend to run seven seasons is because the initial contractual option for an actor in 90s, 80s and 90s television was five seasons. So when you got hired for a show, you got hired off the bat with a contract that said we will pay you X amount of money for five seasons. If the show lasted less than five seasons, it was cancelled, the option was not picked up, and that was grand. If the show managed to hit five seasons, and not only hit five seasons, but be successful enough that the network didn't want to cancel it, what would typically happen is actors would sign extensions to their contracts, and they would crucially get paid lots of money. So, like, when David Duchovny and in particular Gillian Anderson signed up for the X-Files in the first season, they were both relatively unknown actors. I mean, Duchovny had done, like, the Red Shoes Diaries and stuff like that. He'd done Twin Peaks. But he was not an A-list actor of himself. Anderson, I think, only had a handful of screen credits to her name. So they were very cheap for those five seasons. 
when Fox came back and it said, well, look, the show's a hit. It's hit 100 episodes. We're not going to cancel it. We want it on big screens and on television at the same time. Like for Dukovny and for Anderson, that was OK. Re-up, renegotiate. The show is a hit now. We want our share of that money. And justifiably so, given how much money it was raking in. So that's why shows that tend to run seven seasons, you get five seasons of, well, whatever we agreed, we'd pay the actors at the start. When we get to the end, you get two seasons of, yeah, but the show's a hit. So we want a big pay bump. We want to cash in on that. Um, And that's why it's that's why the seven season figure tends to be or tended to be uh, the norm. So like watching the seven season, there is if you wanted to, you could argue that zombie kind of shuffling thing is a metaphor for how I suspect a lot of people. And again, this isn't just supposition. This is looking at interviews at the time. A lot of people working on the show were like, yep, yeah, we're, we're done this year. We're out. This is the end of the X-Files. And again, listeners, to keep you in suspense, wait until the season finale and we'll discuss why that wasn't the case. <laughs> yeah yeah it certainly wasn't and uh you know it's it had a number of different options to go down after season seven but you know we'll get there we're only at the beginning of season yeah. seven so you know there's a there's a long way to go a long way to to um to slowly walk um through you know <laughs> shuffle and, and as it were shuffle through as, as, I, as i'm as i'm feeling this morning actually strangely enough i'm feeling like i'm shuffling through the world you know i'm not fully all fair with the world at the moment and season seven I think for me, it's going to be a really interesting one to when we go through it. Season six was interesting in itself because Carl, Sarah and I were, were going through the season, um, you know, and we had our our episodes that we did. We obviously listened to it and reappraised it. And uh, there's aspects to it which I actually uh, reappraised quite quite nicely. Things like Trevor, for example, not the best episode in the world, but actually... You it's know, a very sweet little story. It's very well constructed, old fashioned. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And and, and and strangely enough, it was written by two people who were on the Millennium set. But um, <laughs> but yeah, so things like that. So and I think season seven has always been a bit of a strange one for me because there is elements in it which I really like, like uh, you know the closure Zynozites, for example. I I actually really like them. I don't know there's there's different different opinions on that. Like sort of Requiem's great, you know, and the fact that it hasn't got the mythology behind it as such it's it's got a really weird kind of thing with it as you say ex-cops so there's a lot that i like in season seven but also a lot that's kind of like ugh. okay so um so yes yeah, so, so it's going to be interesting to see where my reappraisal comes of season seven and when we get to the end of that it's going to- i'm personally waiting for you to declare alpha from the sixth season of masterpiece that's the reappraisal that i am urgently waiting okay. for well um when you, <laughs> at the moment uh, i know clara cook did the coverage of, of alpha i haven't actually re rewatched alpha yet <laughs> And uh, we're getting fast, getting close to the end of season six. So, um, so yeah, so it's uh, it's not uh, not great. So I'm going to have to watch it. But you know, it's got Andrew Robinson in, so you know, at least yeah. it has that going for it. Plain simple, Garrick. Exactly, exactly. But talking about the phone, actually, um, going back to, the, to yeah. the scene where you're saying about the phone being under there, I think it's a great piece of um, storytelling. I think, as you say, with yeah. the, the bell ringing and things like that. The only thing is, I work in a building that's grass covered roof. It's <laughs> one of the, Europe's largest undercover like roof buildings, and I can't get a phone signal. So, <laughs> <laughs> so I'm a bit. Mm, will they have really got a phone signal six feet under? Oh, I'm not too sure. But um, but anyway, it works for the works for it anyway so i love that like you can get a phone signal six six feet under but you can't apparently at this dude's house even though he carries yeah. a mobile phone with him as well like mark johnson's house is unreachable via cell phone but don't worry six feet under dirt it's perfectly fine Nike <laughs> cell phones they built them proper yeah yeah that's why they had the big antennas that's why you had to pull the antenna out right <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah yeah oh you gotta remember those antennas brilliant stuff. yeah um so back into the the graveyard following scene is um you know we've got Mulder in actually physically in the grave and it's interesting how they haven't spent christmas this this year after last year's shenanigans <laughs> they seem to have avoided that <laughs> probably for the best to be fair Although, like and again like the thing is we mentioned the sixth season i should probably just mention and this is one of my favorite little details the x-files for me i think i mentioned this back when i started recording with tony the x-files for me was one of the first shows that was my show it was like because I, I grew up with my gran and granddad showing me stuff that was horribly inappropriate for children it's like watching movies like the shining or the devil rides out or the wicker man with them and like growing up and my taste in horror being informed by that and the x-files was like my show because it was the one that like my it was too hip and with it for my grandparents to get my granddad watched a couple episodes he's like nah, i don't really like this but my favorite detail is that, like, 
his favorite episode of the x-files and one of his favorite episodes of television ever is how the ghost stole christmas right like that that always amazed me <laughs> just love that line you know it's like um you know have a good christmas scully yeah better than last year i think you know i know he doesn't say that but it's a thank you Merry Christmas. we didn't to try to kill each other this year um, <laughs> <laughs> we'll just uh we'll, 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 we'll kiss and make up literally in this this yeah. year won't we i see uh, it's all good there is, uh, I mentioned this on the on, on a video chat that I'm on with some of the X-Cast crew, that um, there's a few elements in this and it always sticks out to me. And, and Little continuity things don't really normally bother me. But when you're looking down at Mulder, the, the, the film looks like it's been flipped a couple of times. There is hair partings on the wrong side a couple of times, which yeah. is like, oh, it's a bit annoying. But, <laughs> um, but never mind. But we do kind of get this aspect of the group because this is, um, alluding to the fact he's an FBI agent, we've got the circle, we've got the the blood around that circle, and then we head into the FBI's office. There's this the kind of like reporting, and Skinner's obviously there. We've got them all around the table because it, obviously it's an FBI thing. But I think it's really interesting that Skinner is giving this job to Morden Scully and asking him to keep it quiet because it obviously, as a ten thirteen trope looks bad for the FBI. What do you make to, to Skinner bringing the, the Millennium Group up? And what I will say is yesterday when I was going through my notes is, isn't it interesting how Dana Scully has a tattoo which is an aerobarist <laughs> and not a word of it is mentioned? Well, I mean, we don't know that Mulder's seen the tattoo yet, do we, shippers? Eh? 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 <laughs> Just saying. I mean, I, I don't think Scully's going to casually bring it up, like oh, in conversation, uh, particularly given how that episode ended for the two of them. <laughs> I mean, I feel, I feel like maybe Scully feels a little bit uncomfortable in that scene, but it doesn't really come up. I feel like it's something that maybe happens like all things. I feel like it's a conversation that happens after all things. I feel like now you can kind of just about get by and be like, maybe Mulder knows about it. Maybe Mulder doesn't. He's not going to mention it in front of Skinner. Um, but what I do find interesting about that scene, and again, it, it's one of the things that you mentioned which is very interesting because you do have that idea of the group and you know again for listeners who are not familiar with millennium just a very very quick bit of back context uh, the millennium group was introduced in the first season millennium as a counterpart to the academy group which is exactly what scully mentions it's a group that consulted for local law enforcement to help solve crimes freelance former fbi agents um, however during the second and third seasons of millennium the millennium group kind of evolved in interesting directions and became this kind of weird judeo-christian cult um in the second season and in the third season this kind of weird like skull and bones type association like everything that everybody imagines happening with davros and bill bill gates and like microchips sort of stuff like the conspiracy light from the x-files so it very much kind of evolved in in interesting directions over the three seasons of millennium i kind of love that like in order to get this episode done in 40 minutes without confusing anybody who hasn't watched Millennium, the whole episode has to be very vague and fuzzy on that. It has to be like, yeah, some stuff happened with the Millennium Group, but don't worry too much about it. We just want you to know the FBI might be a little embarrassed. We're not going to tell you why. It's not like they possibly tried to engineer the end of the world or control human brains, but we just, you know, just whatever, just keep it quiet, keep it on the QT. And I think actually it would be kind of fun like, this is one of those things that I wonder, like, I feel like it's a missed opportunity when Skinner says, keep it quiet. When Skinner, like, gives the data to Mulder and says, keep it on the QT. Like, I kind of, like, part of me when I saw that scene the first time was wondering, are we going to get an episode about the relationship between the Millennium Group and the FBI? Are we going to get, like, a sense of the Millennium Group and its ties to the, you know, the FBI running active being part of kind of what the show is or being part of what the group is but it, it doesn't really come back because skinner makes the point and again this is what i talk about when i talk about the weirdness of this like not picking up where millennium ended even though the way that it's structured through exposition if you didn't know what millennium was you'd assume that all this stuff actually happened on screen and all this stuff is just like baggage carried over and this is just what millennium is as katie pointed out i thought millennium was about zombies because the episode called millennium of the x-files was about zombies so logically these two things would come together things like say skinner pointing out that the group disbanded several months ago and it's like that 
that that's not where millennium yeah. ended like that's not at all there's nothing in like the final of the finale of millennium to suggest that if anything the fin- and again sorry apologies to x cast listeners who are not familiar with this but very broadly speaking the third season finale of millennium ended up with the idea that like the millennium group had infiltrated the fbi and one of their members or somebody associated with them or somebody who was perhaps involved in a complicated relationship with them had taken command of the violent crime unit so like the group suddenly like going i guess we better give up well it was fun while it lasted it's a very strange shift to have in the mythology and a very strange one to introduce with a single line of exposition from skinner um it's a very strange choice and again i get why they made it like you you want to minimize how much like the x-files is already at this stage a complicated show with some mythology and conspiracy theory and like you know the sense i think with the sixth and seventh season carters talked about the challenges in a show that had been running that long in making it accessible to new viewers so you really don't necessarily want to add more baggage from another show on top of that but also it's it's just really odd that the show goes by the way the Millennium Group that organized that was responsible for so much over three seasons, 60 odd episodes of this other TV show. They kind of just called it quits. That That's it. They're done. Done. So, yeah. you know, yeah. it's a very odd choice. You don't get why you never find out why the Millennium Group disbanded. You never find out like what, what happened that they were like, yep, yeah, that's it. We're done. Mm-hmm. You know, it's very strange. I mean, if, in my personal head canon, I'm not necessarily believing that that happened. I, I, I think the Millennium Group may well have stopped their FBI involvement because they've got Emma, who's the main character in season three of Millennium, um, you know, in place to have a controlling feature. And they're just not being as overt as they have been. They have been known to be, you know, a, a secret cabal of, you know, of you yeah. know, Illuminati type people. So you could take it from that. And one of the things I was going to ask you, and it's probably a good point to ask here, is um, what Millennium did in its second season was it uh, divided the group out. So you would have, you know, rather than all one, you know, rather than the syndicate, the syndicate had one main focus of colonization is about to begin, that we we need to um, do what the what the alien colonists have asked uh, and create an alien human hybrid to survive, you know, to survive the uh, the coming apocalypse. And then it would it would build in the the rebel, rebel rebels and stuff like that later on, in that they're infiltrating infiltrating the syndicate and how that would all work in the X Files. With Millennium, you've got um, you know the this idea of owls and roosters that there's a, a split in the in factions of you know some that believe in a secular um, end of the world that you'd have Millennium in the third season talking potentially about it's not so much about the end of the world but the end of culture. And the end, and the way that the people perceive the world more than you know a literal end of the world. So there's a lot of like nuances within that. So I, for example, you know the some of the group believe that the end of the world will be from a gravitational wave that's going to hit us in 70 years, for example. And this episode does that as well because it asks, it says a schism within the group. You know, so kind of a, the religious aspect of the group. You know, that are wanted to bring about the literal end of the world, the literal fog. Um, Horseman of the Apocalypse. Know. So I just wondered, from that point of view, it, it kind of fits, but at the yeah. same time, it is kind of like, it's nothing really to do about the group as such. Um, yeah. and, and that way, it, that's why it kind of alienates everyone that it's trying to please. Yeah, that's it. Like, I mean, you could, if you wanted to, like, construct a millennium mythology, you could argue that these guys are basically the roosters. And again, this is all very confusing to people who have just tuned into the X-Cast and want to hear us talk about Mulder and Scully kissing. Uh, But, like, things like you mentioned, the owls believe in the secular apocalypse. The owl believe that it's still night out. The roosters want to crow at the dawn and believe that it's going to be the turn of the millennium that will signify the end of the world, the apocalypse, the great change that's coming. And the roosters have typically, again, been associated with Christianity. And again, the second season millennium, like with the finding of the true cross and things like that, the hand of St. Sebastian, all these religious artifacts, most of which rooted, again, in Judeo-Christian culture. And even here, I kind of love that the salt that he uses is kosher salt. Mm. And I'm like, ah, see, Judeo-Christian salt. Huh? Anyway, but um, yeah, like that, that's the kind of thing where you can kind of see it's, it's like Skinner saying, I want you to handle this quietly because it's sensitive you can kind of see the germ of an interesting idea and interesting angle to go where it's like, you know, the millennium is happening, but also the tension within 
the Millennium Group or the tension in wider culture about whether or not the turn of the millennium represents anything at all, whether or not it's going to be something that happens naturally. I mean, I know like people who lived through the millennium, people who are old like you and I, Kurt, will remember like Y2K and the idea that like when the clock hit midnight, planes were going to suddenly start falling out of the sky yeah. and all these kind of doomsday predictions as well that were non-technologically based that were going to say, oh, there's going to be earthquakes and volcanoes and the world is going to end and it's going to be terrible and horrifying. And like, Within this, even you have the the kind of the further extension of that, which is, again, an idea that I think Millennium itself explored much more thoroughly and much more insightfully. But the question of whether that belief in apocalypse means wanting to bring it about. So whether or not the people who are most invested in the idea of the end of the world will actually be so fixated on it that they won't just predict it. They will be actively complicit in it. Um, and again, something that was very popular, not pop, sorry, popular, it's a horrible used word to use here. Something that was common in the 90s, these doomsday cults as well. Things like, you know, the kind of like the sarin nerve gas attack in Tokyo. The idea of bringing about or signaling or signifying the end of the world through gesture and through action. And so here, like you have the character of Mark Johnson, who is theoretically bringing about the end of the world by rising or you know kind of reviving the four horsemen and it's again it's an interesting idea because it like one of the fascinating aspects of doomsday is like that urge and again sorry this is very pretentious and i apologize in advance but that kind of like freudian urge of like thanatos you know and again it notable you could argue like if you wanted to be very generous to Millennium as an episode of television, it's that conflict between the two Freudian urges of Eros and Thanatos. Eros being love and Thanatos being death. So you have Mark Johnson, a man who by Frank Black's profile has lived it alone his entire life. He's never had a close connection to anybody. And what he's doing is he's literally trying to bring about the end of the world by reviving the Four Horsemen. And in contrast to that, again, if you're being very generous to the episode, you have Mulder and Scully. And arguably, you could argue even say that the platonic like father-daughter love that happens between Frank and Jordan. But you have this idea of love existing in opposition to death. And the idea that, you know, the doomsday prophecies, the end of the world urges that like seem to permeate pop culture, are that like, is there a part of us that wants that? because we are afraid to love, as corny as that sounds, because we are afraid to embrace the idea of connection with other human beings, which again is a very X-Files, very Millennium theme. And I think these are all interesting ideas in the episode. I just don't think the dots connect, if that yeah. makes sense. And there's no real um, urgency. You know, you think about two fathers and one son. <clears throat> you think that, you know, I'll let colonization yeah. begin. You know, it started and Mulder gives up. You can you can see that you know when it when it comes down to it, when it boils down to it that you know Mulder is 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 giving up because it's pointless. It's, it, there's just no way around it. It's it's happening. There's no no way he can he can stop it from beginning. Um, and you can give you can you can understand the apathy with this. There doesn't seem it's like by the way the end of the world <laughs> is happening in fourteen hours. Yeah, yeah, he literally says 14. Like, and again, like, you, you can kind of see early on why Mulder and Scully wouldn't take this seriously because it looks like a case of grave robbing, you know? And like, you know, that, but the problem is that once, once like even Scully is like, yeah, you know, he's bringing back dead people, you imagine they'd be like, feck, that probably means the world is going to end in 14 hours. We should probably do something about this. But instead, it's just like we're leaving voicemails for one another. We're kind of like we're looking at our phone and kind of going, ah, no signal. I guess I'm going to have to go in there. Um, and like, it's all very blasé. Like, again, it's a very another day at the office for Mulder and Scully, which is very strange. Yeah, it does. It doesn't really land for me. It's, that, that's the one thing. It was like, it doesn't make much sense. Also, as well, what I wanted to discuss before we get the Frank and Mulder and Scully meeting is the with regards to the story itself the fact that it has these religious overtones in it that it's you know it has that millennium kind of feel to it and Scully being the religious one it doesn't seem to lean that way either which I find quite interesting it's very kind of you know Scully does see the literal raising of the dead and reacts to it but reacts in a very non-committal way. And it's just really interesting that we don't seem to have, apart from a small discussion between Scully and Frank at one point, 
we don't seem to have any of that real kind of depth in conversation about what that entails yeah no it is it is kind of like mildly frustrating and again it's one of those things that happens recurrently in the seventh season because by this point like scully has been wrong over a hundred times and like so yeah. like you know scully's original role in the x-files was to debunk Mulder. narratively speaking her job was to say well look it's kind of scientifically plausible if you squint slightly um but the problem is that like after six seasons of that there's only so much you can do with the character and i think like to be fair i think think it is an interesting arc in general over the seventh season and particularly in the eighth season like scully's arc in the eighth season um as she kind of tries to figure out how to be molder and how to believe in the way that molder does is one of my favorite parts of that season but in the seventh season you have this weird dynamic where it really just seems like scully's kind of given up and decided to roll with it um where it's like yep i saw a man brought back from the dead it's exactly what molder said it was i can't really explain it i'm not gonna try let's just go with it um and it's, yeah. it's a very strange particularly when you compare it to things like um was it caddish where they're explaining how a book can catch fire and scully is into it scully's like yeah but you see if the liquid soaked through the exposure to oxygen could have sparked it's like yeah that's the scully i'm here for and it's like by, by millennium it's just like i i don't know that <laughs> don't ask me you know, this, this blue human being <laughs> took three rounds to the chest and he's all right yeah so, yeah, it, it is rather strange. I mean, as I say, I'm surprised that they didn't deal more with Scully and her religious side of things with it. I think it would have been nice to see that. But again, you know, you've only got 45 minutes. You've got an additional Frank and, and, and the like. So when Frank and Mulder and Scully meet, uh, I keep I keep alluding or I keep thinking back to the way that, that Mulder is in space because he obviously has deep respect for, for Frank. He didn't see him he, he, during his time as a Vicap. He left before he got there. But he obviously has, um, you know, a clear respect of him. And it's almost like he's meeting his, his hero because he even says you were not the person that I thought you were going to be and things like that. And I thought that was a, you know, and even some of the questioning that Morda has, it's kind of like, you know, he's questioning a, a suspect or he's questioning a, you know, someone who is obviously gone through a lot, which Frank has, you know, he's been, I think he argues in um, in 13 years later in that episode that I absolutely love that, you know, he's going to have his third mental breakdown and potentially he's on four now. Yeah, this is his fourth, uh, yeah, his fourth mental breakdown. So, yeah, so we think Mulder and Scully have had it bad. But, um, but yeah, it's um, it, it's interesting how, like, you know, the way that Mulder, like, kind of is quite, has quite a lot of empathy and, and actually we're dealing with Frank before we really get into the nitty-gritty of him. So it's, it's, an, it's an interesting meet and I do think it's, it's quite well done in, in in that regard. Well, yes, like, I mean, again, Mulder and, and kind of Frank share common DNA. They're both basically Will Graham from, again, Thomas Harris's work where, you know, again, like people talk about the connection between Dana Scully and Clary Starling. And that's that's very true. That's entirely true. Even looking at the way Gillian Anderson was styled in the early season, the X-Files look almost like Jodie Foster. Things like the use of Jodie Foster in Never Again, for example. And obviously episodes like Beyond the Sea, although I know Morgan and Wong have both said that was not based on Signs of the Lambs. Even though you look at it, it's like, really? Really, really. But like that sort of attention takes the, you know, that sort of like discussion of like Science of the Lambs and influence on the X-Files ignores the fact that, you know, it's Thomas Harris's work in general, including, say, Red Dragon, which had become Manhunter, the movie at that point, um, starring the guy who would be Gil Gris and William Peterson. And like Mulder and Frank are both later iterations, the character of Will Graham. And like, luckily enough, Will Graham is probably better known to the general public or at least to people who watch say the x-files and millennium now than he would have been when they were on the air because obviously he's played by hugh dancy um in the brian fuller tv show and, and like even slightly later by slightly earlier by edward norton in the, the movie red dragon but like yeah. you watching hannibal you can get a sense of yes that character is both Mulder and Frank Plack. And in fact, they actually bring in Lance Henriks in the first season of Millennium to play a serial killer in order to reinforce that idea of there being a connection between the two. And like Mulder and Frank are two sides of the same coin. They're people who are extremely empathic. 
They're extremely sensitive. Like Mulder's big gift, generally speaking, outside of, you know, that horrible episode that we're not going to talk about from the second season where he doesn't believe in ghost rape. Outside of that, Mulder is a hugely empathic character who's always incredibly sensitive to the plight of victims. Think of Oubliette, for example, from the third season. Hell, think of Conduit, the fourth episode of the first season, where like Mulder's big defining characteristic is how open he is, uh, how emotional he is. Again, like there's a reason why why David Duchovny crying is one of those great X-Files kind of memes and moments. It's because Mulder is that character. He's incredibly open and emotional. And Frank Black is, is arguably the same sort of character as well. He understands serial killers because he gets inside their minds and profiles them because he doesn't limit himself to cold detachment. And again, you know, you could argue the big difference between Mulder and Scully is that Mulder, sorry, Mulder and, and Frank Black is that Mulder's big breakdown was driven by the memory and traumatic memory of Samantha's abduction. And so he became obsessed with aliens, whereas Frank's breakdown was related to a serial killer case that he worked and he ended up becoming obsessed with kind of solving and cracking serial killer cases. So they are very much two sides of the one coin. And I like seeing the two of them together. I think it's fun. I think it's interesting. Ironically, like I am not a huge fan of the IDW comics, but one of the things that I really liked there was that like there was an arc of the X-Files. I can't remember if it was season 10. It was probably their season 10 where Frank and Mulder teamed up and actually got to do like proper profiling work together. And I was like, yeah, this is exactly what it looks like. My my problem with Millennium is that it's like, yay, Frank Black and Mulder finally teaming up two sides of the same coin, two children of Will Graham. It's two sons, one father, basically. But together they're gonna shoot zombies in the head in a basement and it's like it feels like a really weird thing to do with these two characters together for the first time it's like i probably would almost have liked it more if they went like crazy horse riding or something you know or had like gone go-karting like i feel like i probably would have got more out of Mulder and frank being together go-karting than i do out of them shooting zombies in the head it's it's a strange one it's a very strange one it is, and and you think to you know later seasons when you know we've got Doggett coming in, and you know a lot of people would say that I know I spoke on Twitter recently, and somebody had said that you know would have liked to have seen a Doggett and Frank combination, and Doggett, you know, he's very kind of a, a different type of character, but he still has that element of you know a, a de facto Frank in some ways. Well, the performance is much closer. Like Robert Patrick's performance is much closer to Lance Henriksen's. Duchovny's is very different. Duchovny's a much more expressive. I think it was a Glenn Morgan, um, who obviously worked as a producer and writer on both Millennium and The X Files, talked about how like the big difference between the shows was uh, the difference between how Duchovny and Henriksen approach the craft of acting. Um, so Duchovny is a very um, kind of sophisticated intellectual actor and i mean like you know i think he was famously one paper away from a phd in english for example you read interviews with him and he's like reading from like joseph campbell's the you know hero with a thousand faces and like i think morgan's talked about how when they were mapping out Mulder's arc with duchovny because duchovny obviously got involved in shaping that you know kind of like in you know with colony end game and then through to the second season finale and things like that so you could kind of see like duchovny intellectually kind of engaging and understanding with like the mythic journey and the hero's arc and all that sort of stuff. Whereas Henriksen was much more intuitive and emotional. And I think one of the big tensions in the second season of Millennium when Morgan and Wong were running Millennium was that for Henriksen, he didn't always have the emotional connection to the material that he felt he needed, uh, even though Morgan and Wong understood intellectually what the arc was supposed to be. So I think, yeah, I think there is a very, like, again, this is, Mulder, Mulder and Frank Black, two sides of the same coin. The similarities in terms of like originating as, you know, Will Graham Mark II, but the differences in terms of how different the energy of those two actors is. Duchovny and, and Black are worlds apart in terms of performance, which I think makes it more interesting to put them together. I like I kind of I would love to see Doggett and, and Black team up, if only because I love Doggett and I want more Doggett. I, I would watch yeah. Doggett solve crimes with a dog. Um, like an actual dog and dog it. I would watch <laughs> that show because I love dog it so much. Um, it'd be called like dog it pursuit or something like that. It'd be fantastic. Fox, get on. I mean, Disney, get on the phone. Come on. You can give me an eight part streaming series for this. Um, but <laughs> like, I think that if you had Patrick and Henriksen together, um, I wonder if their performance styles may be kind of too similar, um, if that makes mm. sense. They, like they give off the same energy. 
Yeah, but so what about Frank Black then? Because you're, we're talking about, yeah, you know, the fact of, of the different character traits of the actors and the way that they approach it, but also Frank's, Frank's, um, you know, if, if there's anything going uh, from a continuation of Frank, it's it's his relationship with his daughter Jordan. You know, he doesn't want to get involved in this. He's he's having to. Scully brings it up that he's having a custody battle with uh, with them, and uh, you know, the fact that. You know, Frank does not want to do that. But at the same time, he mentioned the first and 18th, uh, you know, moment just to, to get the Book of Revelation out there so that Mulder can catch on to it as a little arcane hint. Um, so the fact that he does it, he, he wants to help. Frank does want to help. And even he accepts himself that the fact that he he, he um, has taken, that he has taken the Millennium Group over his daughter. And, and that's the one thing he doesn't want to do. I think that's a nice little touch within this episode that it worked. That works to, to a degree. But I don't know how much it would um, really land for those people who haven't seen Millennium. Yeah, you know, because to them it's just like, oh, it's a daughter. Well, of course he's gonna have he's gonna have uh, his daughter over. But you don't know the backstory to Frank, so I'm not sure how it would land for it's, people who just watch the X Files. It's that old joke, you know, it's that joke that people said about Tenet, where like you know, where the characters are explaining, oh my god, the world is going to end, and then Elizabeth Debicki's character says. That includes my son. Um, and it's like, yes, there are emotional stakes now because we know one of the characters has a child and it's the most obvious connection you can make. And like, I think that is a very real problem with the episode. I think it's it's an obvious problem for X-Files fans because X-Files fans have never even like seen Jordan. Like as far as yeah. they're concerned, Jordan never even existed. So, you know, they, they talk about how Frank wants to see his daughter again, but it's like, it's like Jordan appears less in this episode than the daughter and Trevor, to give an example. Like the daughter and Trevor is more important to the plot and function of that episode than Jordan is to Millennium. And I think that I suspect the reason for that is probably because Brittany Tiplady is based in Vancouver um, and they could only fly her out for a day. Um, I also suspect it's partly down to the fact that so much else is happening in the episode. But like, even if you are a Millennium fan, I'm not entirely sure that that arc really lands because like part of the appeal of seeing Frank Black is seeing him interact with Jordan. And like, again, Henriksen, I cannot sell this enough or stress this enough for anybody who hasn't watched the show. Henriksen is phenomenal. Um, and Tip Lady is an amazing, like, child actor. And the two of them together are just magic. And it feels really odd that, like, while Millennium understands that that, the, the episode Millennium understands that that core relationship is the heart of the show and it's what you want to anchor this story in, it's also like, yeah, but we're only going to have them on screen for a couple of seconds at the end. That's the only interaction that we are going to show between them. And it it just it, it doesn't really work narratively or emotionally. It doesn't make the connection that it kind of needs to. I can kind of see why it would work intellectually, but it's just such a strange, strange decision, particularly when, like, as you mentioned like the third season of Millennium ended with the two of them riding off into the sunset together. It's, it feels very odd that the episode is just like, yep, yeah, she Jordan's just a, a generic child and, and Frank is just a generic dad trying to be reunited with his generic child. And it's it doesn't feel special or unique or distinct. There's no reason to care about this um, really outside of that intellectual exercise, which is a problem, I think. Yeah, yeah, and I always going to the time is now stuff is that you know they've drove driven off away, assuming that because they they believe that you know that what they've seen coming towards them is going to be an, an issue, but then somehow they end up in a custody battle. So it's like, where did they drive to? Did they just drive home? <laughs> <laughs> just Frank like, shows up out of nowhere at his parent in law's house because we know that went well. Looking back at Paper Dove, right? Am I right? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so yeah, so I thought that, that in itself is strange. But anyway, we're looking at it too, in too much detail. Um, we do get a bit of Frank as well with with the profile, which, uh, as you, you met, you've alluded to the, the profile before, but the the profile itself is as generic as it could possibly be. To be fair, it's a white male, forty five to fifty, a religious man with a van, basically. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's a, a serial killer kind of. I like I the way that you say "man with a van." Killer, but... You say like necromancy on the go. It's like, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> like, do you need somebody resurrected? Do you need it done quick? Are you willing to pay cash in hand? Well, then maybe we have the man for you. Yeah, and and especially the fact that 
he has um he's been he's a contractor he's a necromancer contractor <laughs> and yes. that he seems to know a lot about frank yes and it's like has he been given like a you know a, a, a portfolio of like by the way you know, if everything goes to, to pot, you can always rely on Frank. He'll come, he'll come and save it at the end of the day. Well, again, like, that's the thing where you have the weird distaff kind of Millennium stuff where you can kind of draw a squiggly line uh, between this and, uh, like, stuff that actually happened in Millennium and see, like, maybe this was an inspiration for it. Maybe this is what the writers are thinking of. Maybe this is where it's going. Because, like, in, like, Millennium itself, you have this recurring motif of the group as highly secretive, but also working with outsiders. I'm thinking of the Brad Dorif character in Force Majeure, for example, or yeah. Brian Rodecker um, in the second season, Millennium, who's the, their IT guy, but who is, like, shut off from the group with absolutely no notice whatsoever. And so you can kind of get a sense of them exploiting people who are maybe vulnerable or easily malleable. So that kind of makes sense in terms of, like, Johnson as a character. But, like, to bring it back to what you said there, watching Millennium, right? Watching the, the and again, I feel like when I say Millennium, I need to specify the episode of the show. Watching the show Millennium, right? And again, this is just for ex-cast listeners who are not familiar with the show of, of Millennium. The group, the bulk of Millennium, or at least a large part of the first two seasons of Millennium is given over to the idea the Millennium group is trying to recruit Frank. Um, and the show doesn't really suggest that Frank is like particularly special. He's not a chosen one. It's just that Frank is gifted at what he does and the Millennium Group would like to use his gifts. And when I say he's gifted at what he does, he's a criminal profiler who can peer into the minds of serial killers. Um, and like that's something that the group is very interested in studying and exploiting and harnessing for its own ends. And so you have this kind of tension through the first two seasons where the group is trying to draw Frank into its inner circle and trying to isolate him from the people around him. It's basically a cult. Um, they they try to cut him off from people who care about him. His wife, um, who at one point he's estranged from, his family, um, other people, that the members of the Bureau and things like that. And so, you know, what's really odd about Millennium, the episode, is that it seems like Spotnitz and, and Gilligan kind of honed in on that, honed in on the narrative of the group trying to recruit Frank and particularly through the character Peter Watts played by Mr. 1013 Terry O'Quinn. I really hope I'm selling X-Files listeners on the TV show Millennium because it's fantastic. But anyway, you get the sense in which like Gilligan and Spotnitz have honed in on this idea of like the last temptation of Frank Black by the Millennium group. But they're like, yeah, but there needs to be a reason why the group was so interested in him, even beyond his kind of like, you know, weird never really explained deliberately ambiguous ability to get into the heads of serial killers and so the episode millennium spins that wheel and ends up on well the millennium group had probably always intended for frank to commit suicide and be resurrected as a zombie so he could bring about the end of the world and like again i feel the need to stress this for people who have not watched millennium there is no indication of any of this in the show. None of this makes any sense whatsoever. It, it's a really weird grafting on of mythology where it's not needed at all. Because as you point out, Mark Johnson's like, yeah, they told me about you, Frank. It was always meant to be you, Frank. You were always meant to be one of the four. And like, there's no indication in Millennium that like the Millennium Group wants to resurrect four dead FBI agents as zombies to end the world for some reason. But also no indication that they want Frank to commit suicide so he can be resurrected as a zombie to end the world. It's a very strange, labored kind of plot element, I think. It is. And I, the, only, the only thing that it has going for it is that Frank doesn't believe that the dead would arise. Now it's very X-Files. You know, it's kind of, kind of like that is not in the millennium world of like you know there's the the thematic aspect of it there's there is x-file elements in season two with uh, you know finding the crucifixion of the cross uh you know there's that uh, where whoever holds that cross um will win the war and it's a battle for good and evil so there's always been this battle for good and evil thing um and it's been a bit more as you say, as you say more esoteric rather than actually overt as this would be like what the x-files is to say well, you didn't actually think that zombies would raise from the dead. That wasn't what we were intending. We were just <laughs> talking about the greater evil versus good kind of aspect. Yeah. So, and yes, you could fight a little bit, but the fact that Frank says, no, I didn't believe it. <laughs> uh, but I do now. Um, and this is the thing for me in in this moment. And again, it, whether or not it depends on how you view Frank. If you view Frank from an outsider, that 
does this episode, I don't think it does personally, does this episode give you enough ambiguity that you think Frank actually could do this? Where if you're a Millennium fan and you're seeing Frank outside that house and he's saying, uh, I, d- I didn't believe the dead were arise. You've paid so dearly. You've taken, they've taken your daughter. They've done this to your wife. There's no justice in the world. And it's like, but you've not, there's no, there's no, Frank wouldn't go down that yeah. route. He's too, he's too good. He's too good to, to even go down that route. There's no, absolutely no urgency, no agency yeah. in my head that Frank would ever go down that route. Yeah, no, it's an impossible thing to sell, particularly in the context of, again, like bringing Frank Black in, like, even if you don't know Millennium, you know that the character is important because Lance Henriksen gets a special guest star credit. Even if you didn't know Millennium was a TV show, you probably get the sense that like Frank Black is a character from something else as well because of the way that other characters kind of talk about him and the way in which like he's introduced with Mark Snow using a theme that sounds like a show that isn't the X-Files. Spoiler, it sounds like Millennium. But even if you didn't know that, you'd still be like, yeah, those violins are a very odd mix on the X-Files soundtrack. Obviously, this is a character from a show that has a soundtrack involving violins. It's a different show. So even if you knew only that about Frank, watching that scene, would you honestly believe that Chris Carter, Frank Spotnitz and Vince Gilligan had brought back a character from another TV show for him to suddenly decide that he wants to end the world? Um, because sure, why not? Um, it, I guess everybody's doing it these days. Th- there's no real attempt to sell it. There's no real investment in it. It's all very much kind of it's very obvious from the outset that it's classic Oh, I I understand what you're saying, crazy person. Now give me the gun so I can arrest you. And it doesn't. There's no sell on it. Like that. That's one of the big problems with the episode. And you've you've come back to it repeatedly. There's no urgency. There's there's no stakes. Like and again, like I feel like we haven't emphasized this enough. This is an episode about the end of the world. It's a the culmination of three years of storytelling on Millennium and what the Millennium Group's end game was. And it's four zombies like it's four <laughs> zombies and one of them gets shot through the head quite early yeah yeah it's uh, it's it's really strange yeah so i, I just want a couple of things to mention while at white in my head octavia spencer's obviously appears in this episode as nurse as octavia nurse, as nurse octavia which was quite nice uh, i used that in the quiz going back all the way back to that 24 hour um question <laughs> thing and tony didn't get it i was like i was quite surprised I kind of I want to believe that was a throw it in from Henriksen. Like I, I like the way in which because yeah. it's just like she's Octavia Spencer. She's playing Nurse Octavia. I like to think that Lance Henriksen was just like, you have a first name. It's your first name. I've decided it. That's the line. <laughs> yeah. And that shall be ever be down <laughs> as what he did. Yeah. Um, and they the end scene in the basement, which is kind of like I can imagine this being in the heads of this is where we want to get to. This is the image of millennium that i want to see <laughs> being that you've got a sandy basement i don't know how american american basements work i really don't um so that you've got within that you've got these um you know the is he storing them there is, is that is that the situation how did they resurrect at that point yeah. you know the kosher he... salt is really just to help preserve the meat really it's that's like it's it's also good for like circles <laughs> and summoning circles and protection circles and things like that but it's it's also just really good when you have zombies for making sure that the the meat doesn't go off yeah and i, I also do like the the matrix um shades at Mulder's <laughs> when when he gets to the house as well i thought that was quite good but uh yeah, so so Mulder ends up, and it is quite effective that Mulder's actually within the the salt circle. And I think it would go amiss of us not to mention the very fact that he does taste it at one point because he has to. Wait, that's, that's, that's Mulder. That's, that's how limit. Mulder works. Like that. Also, like I mean, I don't want to tell any law law enforcement professionals who are listening to this their jobs, but don't do that. Don't do no. that. I mean, I'm wondering, did he taste the gold, goat's blood? Yeah. That's my question. And was he able to tell the difference from taste? It's like, that's, <laughs> yeah. it's blood. It's definitely blood. Some sort of mammal. <laughs> Is it a, could be a cow. No, no, goat. Yep, yeah, definitely goat, bud. Yeah, I'll just check my <laughs> uh, my pH scale on my tongue. Yeah, yeah that's the one. Yeah. Oh, no, I might have to put that into my mind computer. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, so he uh, he ends up down there, and Frank actually comes down, and uh, <laughs> Mulder says, "You armed?" And Frank goes, "Oh yeah." It's like, <laughs> when 
Where did that come from? <laughs> That's the version of Frank Black from Like Jose Chung's Doomsday Defense. <laughs> I mean, it's Rocket McGraw. Rocket McGraw doesn't have time for zombies and negative thoughts. He just has a gun and he's ready to go. And again, like, again, like, this is the thing where you mentioned the weirdness of it because, again, you can see that weird zigzag line between, like, Again, this feels like somebody's fever dream memory of Millennium having caught it on TV at like 3.30 at the morning in the morning and like drifting off halfway through. Like, as you pointed out, the basement, the basement is fundamental to what Millennium is. For listeners on the X-Files or X-Cast who are not familiar with Millennium, one of the big recurring motifs of the show is the idea of the basement as this kind of subconscious space where Frank has created a perfect family house, the big yellow house, which has this kind of idealized family that he wants to live in with his daughter and his wife. But in the basement, he keeps all his files, all his information, all his like work for the FBI and for profiling. So the basement becomes this space of darkness and horror and it becomes even more of a space of darkness and horror later on in the first season in episodes like lamentation and again i'm not going to say what happens there in case people want to watch the show of their own volition but if you know you know exactly what i'm referring to the basement becomes a scene of crime it's stained it's horrific and it's nightmarish so you can kind of see why when like again spotnitz and gilligan were scripting the episode millennium they're like yeah there has to be a scene where frank goes down into a basement and confronts evil because thematically that's what works but then you're also like yeah but but like the evil that Frank faces in the basement isn't zombies. And like one of the big recurring things about Frank as a character, like how Chris Carter defined like Frank Black as a character in the first season was like as a cowboy without a gun, as the stranger who comes into town to solve the problems. But he does it using empathy rather than a firearm. So it's really strange that it's like we're going to get Frank in the basement and then we're going to have Mulder ask him if he has a gun and he's going to say, oh, yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. And especially because as at the beginning, it was like Frank doesn't have a gun. He talks his way out of situations. Yeah. You know, he'll, he'll talk to the the people that are very evil and like understand them rather than actually shoot them. And and like in the so, second so. season, when he takes the gun, like when he, ta- when he starts using like weapons in the second season, so like knives and guns and stuff, like it's a sign that Frank is unbalanced or in a place where he is volatile. And like, it's a sign that Frank is not healthy. Whereas here in millennium, it's like Frank Black's back, baby. Um, <laughs> Let's shoot some zombies. Yeah, again, you're waiting for him to take off sunglasses, take off, take out sunglasses, and put them on, even though he's in a basement. It's like finally I can cut loose. Well, I suppose the gun is quite western. <laughs> I'll give him that. That is fair. That is fair. I'll give him. I'll give him that because you know it's it's it is a revolver. Maybe it's, it is a revolver. Yeah, yeah. So I suppose you know you could say that you know this is his final barrage and like let's go do this. Let's <laughs> let's finish this off and kill those zombies. There'll be no more zombies in the valley. <laughs> uh yeah so it shoots him in the head because that seems to do the work you know if anyone's seen any zombie movies yeah. then you know our tv show okay shooting them in the head tends to work it's, a, it's an actual line i think from nine of the living dead shoot them in the head it seems yeah. to stop them shoot them in the head that's a sure way to kill them i'm very disappointed that Mulder never actually said by removing the head or destroying the brain i'm really disappointed <laughs> they couldn't work that into the script that comes to the 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 end of the world is has um, hopefully been averted. You know that was it. Four people in a basement, <laughs> six six beings in a basement. So um, and that brings the episode to the end. Oh, sorry, no, there's something else that happened. <laughs> must, must must talk about this. Wow, wow, <laughs> wow! And I thought I upset shippers earlier on. Well done, Kurt. No, right, okay. So this is where I say, you know, as I, I, I am, I do lean towards more of the agnostic. I must admit, I do say I'm a no Romo. Uh, as much as I say I'm a no Romo, I think I need to kind of um, put my cards out on the table because I've, I've sent, mentioned this in season six, where it doesn't bother me if they get together. I'm not concerned about that. As long as, as you, as you say, as long as it relates to the story. And I'm a big mythos person. I enjoy the kind of mythology of the show. Uh, and as long as it doesn't get in the way, it doesn't bother me. If it happens off screen, great. If it happens on screen and there's a reason for it, fair enough. Um, I just don't want to see it a lot of the times. Like, I just don't want to see it. Um, do they have to do it in front of me? Yeah, Can't, they have to. Whatever Mulder the, and Scully choose to do in the comfort of their own bedroom is their own business. 
Um, exactly. And I do love bits, and, I, and I've mentioned this in, in season six, things like Triangle at the end yeah. when he says, I love you. I love those bits. I think that, you know, the kiss in, in, in Triangle is so much better than this one. <laughs> uh, and I get why they've done it, and, you know, but it's just like, and I put my head down and go, okay. I mean, and what's, fair, really frustrating, some... what's really frustrating for me is the way in which the episode just kind of basically tells Jordan and Frank to feck off. And it's like, it's like, <laughs> like there's a way like, oh, you're united. That's fantastic. Daddy and daughter back together. That's really great. Now get out of the fecking room so we can have the big kiss moment. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, so what do you make to, if, if we're going to go down this route then, what do you make to Mulder and Scully's relationship at this point up until this moment up until this well again like one of the things uh, i know that you kind of say that you're you're happier when it's kept off screen again i don't mind i don't mind if it's not off screen as long as kept you know as long as it works and one of the things i actually really like and i know this is again darren continues to upset x-files fans one of the things that i always really liked about Mulder and scully uh, was the way in which it was deliberately ambiguous as to whether they were whether they weren't when they started when they stopped and all that sort of stuff so like you could watch the x-files and believe that like off screen the two of them were doing all sorts of stuff to each other um and like just coming into work the next morning and like it was no biggie let's not talk about it that sort of stuff and again in the context of the 90s when you had a bunch of stuff happening in culture where people were beginning to realize that you know that like life and fulfillment and like romance didn't always have to conform to the nuclear family where it's husband wife 2.4 children it could be you know gay couples it could be polyamorous it could be no strings attached it could be friends with benefits you had this idea creeping into the mainstream in the 90s and i really liked that aspect of the Mulder and scully relationship because it felt like a very 90s relationship where it's like we might be doing stuff we might not be doing stuff we're not going to put a label on it. It's none of your business. Um, it wouldn't matter if we were or if we weren't. I really liked that aspect of kind of like the Mulder and Scully dynamic across the show's run. My yeah. my head canon is that they were probably doing it around the fifth season. That's the point at which for me it probably really kicked off. Um, and again, that's largely because the show starts really leaning into it um, in episodes like Detour, for example, uh, where you have like them talking about agents sharing the room together and Mulder being, oh, don't try any of that tail hook stuff with me um, because it's <laughs> yeah. the 90s and we can joke about that stuff, apparently. But like it, you kind of have that sense of them being flirtatious with one another, them being playful with one another. Things like Mulder's jealousy of Luke Wilson's character in Bad Blood, for example. So in my own personal head and you have the trauma in the fourth season between Mulder and Scully and you have obviously like everything that happens to Scully in the fourth season with the cancer diagnosis and all that sort of stuff and the the problem that happens with her relationship with Mulder in Never Again where that kind of breaks down and you have even like you know outside of that you have the themes and the ideas of kind of like motherhood and family in like home where like Scully's confronted with this monstrous idea of like a recognizable family unit with a mother and children but it's a place of grotesque abuse and horror and so scully reacts to all of that and says no i i don't want that i want something else i want something more freeing and more liberating and less less conforming and less kind of labored and you have Mulder and scully for to my imagination or my reading of the show in the fifth and sixth season kind of probably going at it like rabbits off screen and just like never really processing it and working through it because Mulder is like not a functioning adult in many senses and Scully is like dealing with a whole bunch of stuff on her own that she needs to work through so I and you know the two of them being genuinely happy together and things like you know the sixth season the X-Files like being a Mulder and Scully romantic comedy. Like the Rain King is a romantic comedy with Mulder and Scully in it. Triangle, as you pointed out, is a farce with Mulder and Scully in it. And that stuff, I I actually really, really like that stuff. And I think, and again, this is probably, this is a separate discussion and I'm sorry we've derailed the Millennium episode podcast into it. I think you can tell that Carter is not interested in writing a conventional relationship for Mulder and Scully. Again, it's notable that like at every opportunity he takes to break up the two of them. Once like 
Mulder and Scully stop spending time together on screen once they become an official couple. Um, (laughs) You know, like Mulder runs off because Duchovny's not interested in doing the show anymore. And then like Carter breaks them up off screen before the revival happens as well. Um, Because like, I get the real sense that Carter isn't interested in writing a conventional couple. And I mean, even if you look at things like, say, his other shows, like, again, Frank Black, was it Emily Vanderwerf made the wonderful joke about Paper Dove that, like, you you could believe that, like, Jordan was found under a cabbage patch. Because, like, as wonderful as Frank and Catherine are together, you you don't believe the two of them have ever really had sex. And, like, when you see them in bed together in, like, Paper Dove... It's Emily Vanderwerf who makes the joke that even married people aren't safe on this show when they have sex because like Catherine is immediately kidnapped after that. Um, But yeah, so I kind of like and even like, say, Harsh Realm, which was airing around this time. That was the Carter show that Millennium was cancelled to make room for. Harsh Realm is also built around this idea of a chase romance. It's a it's a guy stranded in a world trying to get back to his fiance. But the structure of the show means that Carter is never going to have to write like scenes in which a husband and wife or like boyfriend and girlfriend or two fiancés actually have to be a couple together because they're defined by their yearning and their wanting. And so that's when we get to the kiss here, the kiss feeling very much like one of those cross the T's, dot the I's, the show is over and done with now. We're not going to be coming back for an eighth season. I'm not going to have to deal with the baggage of this so we can finally give the fans what they want without like confining me and forcing me to write something that I don't want to write. So yeah, let's have Mulder and Scully kiss. And then, you know, at the end of the season, it'll be over and fans can pretend whatever happened afterwards. And I will never have to deal with this problem whatsoever. Carter says, rubbing his hands together as all of a sudden Fox goes into one of its worst seasons in history. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, I think I think you're right. Looking back at the show on, on its early 90s run, it would appear to be too soapy. Um, now that's not necessarily something that I would say, but I think the X Files sort of delineated itself from that, and it works because of that. And I don't think it would have even the the viewership of the shippers if it had not been for that. So I think that there is there is a, a weird dichotomy happening between. Well, that's the, the two. Moonlight curse as well, like because um, Moonlight was yeah. driven by that tension between was it Sybil Shepherd and Bruce Willis, and as soon yeah. as the characters hooked up, that all evaporated and like interest was lost and ratings dropped, and the writers found it much difficult to much more difficult to write for. So yeah, I can see why there'd be that trepidation in getting the two of them together. To be fair, mm, yeah, and then you you, you think to shows like that happened afterwards, like say Fringe, for example, which takes a lot of X file cues in its first season, especially that um you know they're a lot quicker to get the the main couple together but what they tend to do with it is they use science fiction tropes and um you know aspects that happen around them which break them up or yeah. provide angst with them you know the fact that there's, there's I won't spoil it if anyone hasn't seen fringe but there's aspects of like in the third season where you know they they they're just about to get together they do get together but something happens and it's like Oh right, and it's dealing with the aftermath of it, and uh, you know, and and there's some real tension built up in that. But I think the X Files at the time was too early for that, and I think Fringe does it really well. Um, you know, Fringe was a lot from a from a perspective of viewership is is a lot lower, but there is a lot of people that will have that kind of ship with those two characters because of the way that they're they're written, and there's always this like breaking them up, bringing them back together, breaking them up, bringing them back together, but in a kind of science fiction world. And that works a lot better because it's like you, you can deal with emotional aspects of that because you feel the angst rather than, oh, the book have broken up again. And X-Files doesn't have that. So I can see it from that point of view. I agree with you with the, the whole, you know, season six light stuff. I love the ranking, strangely enough. And I love Triangle. So I do like, you know, that those, those kind of shippy moments and stuff. And I think it's nice that they play around with it. And I think it's the right time to do it in season six. Um, Sarah Blair will love the fact that you think it's in season five. So, you know, because she thinks it definitely happened in Redux. <laughs> so um, so she'll love that. But um, but yeah, so it's, a, it's an interesting moment for, to, as you say, to the kind of, it, it, and it does when you said dot the I's and cross the T's. It feels like that. Yeah. It doesn't feel like, you know, it's like, well, here's the kiss for you. It's like, let's linger on that for a second of them just touching lips. And it's like, and then you have Mulder saying the world didn't end as if like, again, yeah. the show is saying 
Look, it happened. It happened. You can't say that it didn't. <laughs> Look at it. That's all you're going to get. Yeah, yeah. And with a little sly smile from Scully, you know, and that concludes, you know, what was going to happen <laughs> in, in the alley, in the, um, in the uh, corridor in the film. So, yeah, so that brings the episode to an end. Is there anything you want to bring up just before we go into the mailbag? Anything I may have missed during that discussion? I would ask people listening to this on the Xcast feed not to judge Millennium by this episode. That would be all that I would ask. Um, I think, like, again, the first season of Millennium can be quite tough to get into, but, like, the second half of the first season is phenomenal. Um, I think once it finds its feet, I think, like, it's quite strong from the outset, but it's very heavy going. And then in the second half of the first season, it kind of figures out how to make the formula work more consistently and like it becomes some of the best television ever i would argue the second half of the first season of millennium the second season of millennium that's a phenomenal block of television and if you like 1013 if you like the x files if you like that sense of you know again darkness ominous uh meditations on kind of like the world as it existed in the 90s like philosophical stuff I would say try it. Don't be put off by this episode, Darren says, after spending an inordinate amount of time being very mean to this episode, and I'm sorry. Because it isn't Millennium. It is, yeah, fair. <laughs> that's fair. Basically. Uh, let's, uh, let's jump into the mailbag, because I'm sure there'll be plenty to discuss once we get into there as well. So let's go and do that now. Okay, Adam Silver. He uh, posted on the X-Cast. Um, thanks, Adam. So this is all the, the X-Cast side of things. So um, not the conclusion Millennium deserved. They were too committed to making sure it was a standalone X-File episode. But it was nice to see Mulder, Scully and Frank together and to see Frank and Jordan get a happy ending. Otherwise known for the kiss, but even the characters seemed dis- disappointed. And hearing Millennium score music in, again was also quite nice. So that, that I would definitely yeah. uh, agree with that. Um, Tony has been on as well, Tony Black. Um, as someone who adores Millennium and at times generally thinks, genuinely thinks it might be better than the X Files, I'll get my cult. I think uh, I, I might get my cult as well, Tony, to be fair. Um, I always enjoy I this may episode. take half of my coat. Yes, I'll take half of it. <laughs> You'll take half. Um, you know, just the, the little crop top <laughs> denim jacket you've got. Um, it matches um, my critic hat. <laughs> it sounds like a weird sense of uh, you know the culture fan art we, we need fan art of this now apparently anyway don't don't Absolutely. draw fan art don't some sort of like cursed fan art like Hulu fan art anyway sorry <laughs> he always enjoys this episode it's an awkward hybrid between both stylistically unique series but seeing Mulder and Frank Black on screen together even briefly is worth its weight in gold the kiss is cool but Frank and Jordan getting to walk off into the sunset hand in hand is what really makes me coo about this episode. Yeah, I can, I can buy that. Like, I'm much more satisfied with the Frank and Jordan ending than I am with the Mulder and Scully kiss, to be fair. Yeah, I am as well. Uh, Andrew Levitt, for me, Millennium, the episode, feels like a return to form for the X-Files. It's dark, it has a lot of creepy moments, puts both agents in danger, and has a sinister undertone of men conspiring to do something in secret. I saw this episode before I had this, seen much of Millennium, the series. After watching that series and then returning to this episode, it doesn't quite seem like the send-off Frank Black deserved. The kiss seems a bit superfluous, but I don't dislike it. Regardless, Millennium, the episode, is one of the few episodes uh, season seven uh, of season seven that I enjoy because it captures what the show is about and gives it a seven out of ten. That's interesting in itself because around this episode, we've uh, briefly talked about it. We've got the... Biogenesis, um, two-parter, if you don't include Biogenesis from last, last season. You've got Rush and you've got uh, Hungry, haven't you? So yeah. it's, it, out of those, I would say it's definitely the better of those episodes, personally. I don't Ooh, know that's that, them's fighting words is what them's is. Um, <laughs> well, no, well, maybe not Omar Fati and <laughs> Six Extinction, oh. but I'm, I'm thinking more Rush and, um, Rush and uh, Hungry. I actually much. I think Hungry is vastly underrated. Actually, I would argue. Um, I really, really, really loved Hungry, and like Rush is, Rush is an episode that's very interesting to watch. And sorry, I realize I'm kind of like this is not the Rush podcast, Darren. And it's like, damn it, I got my <laughs> guitar and my beard and my long hair. I, I was going to talk about Rush, but no, Rush. We're just going to do a 24 hour podcast where we just talk about every episode. every episode of the season one at a time. I hope you're prepared, baby. I can I can go all night. But no, what I, what I like about Rush, and it's kind of interesting watching it. 
Like, again, in context of a 1999 episode of television, Rush now looks like a weird superhero origin story. Like, it reminds me a yeah. lot of something uh, like, was it Josh Trank's movie Chronicle? where you have a bunch of kids who develop magic superpowers and start acting. Some of them act responsibly, some of them act irresponsibly, and it's all kind of horrible and monstrous and kind of like pushes it in uncomfortable directions. I think Rush has aged really well in that sense because it does, like it arrived in 99 before like Sam Raimi's Spider-Man, before Brian Singer's X-Men. So it was not intended. It was absolutely not intended in that way. And I'm not arguing that it was. But I, I kind of I appreciate it going back and looking at it and seeing it being kind of like, well, the X-Files is winding down. 90s television is winding down. The 90s is over. What's coming next? It's going to be the superhero boom, baby. And already we're doing Mulder and Scully crash into superheroes. And again, you could argue that that kind of continues into the kind of like revival where you have like James Wong's Founders Mutation, which is basically what if Mulder and Scully went to the X-Men school, basically, is the, is yeah. the crux of that episode. So I, I like Rush in that sense. And Hungry is just like a really clever concept. It's the point of view of the monster. It's very much a kind of it's one of those and like X-Cops, like We've talked about the seventh season. I've been rather mean about the seventh season, and I'm very sorry about that. If I wanted to say something like in praise of the seventh season, uh, in particular, the work of Vince Gilligan, who, who I've also been very mean to in this episode. So I'm making a lot of amends now. What I would say I like about the seventh season is that like you can see everybody's very tired, but you can also see that Chris Carter's like, feck it, Vince, that idea that you've had for the past, like three or four years and you kept pitching me and I kept saying no F write it feckin' write it and we'll put it on the air so like Hungry is like a point of view of the monster episode and it's like you you get the sense yeah this is something the show probably could have done a lot earlier but everybody shot down but now it's the you know we think it's the final season so why not do it or x cops where like i think gilligan had been like pitching since the fifth season he wanted to do was it an unsolved yeah. mysteries episode with robert stack with like stand-ins for Mulder and scully actors playing Mulder and scully and you can kind of see x cops is like that except instead of like unsolved mysteries it's cops so i kind of like if, if I had something to say in defense or praise of the seventh season, it's that anything goes attitude. And so I, I really have a soft spot for Hungry, I will say. Sorry, I feel like I'm being mean to Millennium. Apologies. You know, I think Spotnitz, was it Spotnitz that was the one that alluded to the fact that, you know, in, in all kind, in, in all episodes, you could, in theory, say that, it, that the Monster of the Weeks were alien episodes. Yeah. And, you know, something like Founder's Mutation, for example, is a perfect example of, of that kind of um, aspect of, you know, in, in in a different world, if yeah. this was played out twenty years later, yeah, like on Fringe, for example, or whatever, yeah, 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 there would have been more overt with the you know Tombs is is a, a genetic mutant, but that's because of you know the the alien virus which mutated him into that superpower. Yeah. That's the sort of thing that would, that would have gone down. So I suppose you could say it's a precursor. Rush, for example, is is a perfect example of that. Yeah. Um, I also wanted to mention just while just while I was looking there, I was looking at the season and. Um, we, we, I think we need to give credence to Thomas J. Wright because he's not, I don't think he's been anything direction wise up until now, has he? Because he's, he's Mr. Millennium. He was he's, Mr. He's Millennium. Directed. He directed like almost half of Millennium, if I remember correctly. Some sort of like <laughs> yeah. weird statistic where like, if you pick a Millennium episode, you are more likely than not to end up like with a Thomas J. Wright episode. Um, and again, like we should point out, like Wright is, I think he studied under Hitchcock. I think he was like a storyboard yeah. artist under Hitchcock, for example. So he's like, he he knows what he's doing. And I would argue like some of his work on Millennium is fantastic, particularly given the budget of that show. So yeah, no, absolute praise and nothing but respect for Thomas J. Wright. Yeah, I mean, obviously he comes over and directs a few episodes. He comes and does uh, Goldberg Variation and Signs and Wonders, uh, not Signs and Wonders, Kim's Man, I that, Kim's Man is that, The Amazing Bellini. Yeah. Um, so it appears on, on a couple uh, of episodes during the course of, of this run, um, it, that, you know, Goldberg Variation as well. That really so, kind of feels like Carter. And again, this is one of the things that you saw. And again, like it's, it's one of the things that I actually do genuinely like about some like showrunners and writers and directors is that like they have a group of people that they like working with, but also who they also like to keep employed. Um, and so they will bring those that talent with them to other projects. So like to pick examples, uh, James, 
James, you know, sorry, James Wong and Glenn Morgan, their work on, say, Space Above and Beyond with that cast mm. and crew and that talent. When they came back to the X-Files, they brought a lot of that talent with them to, to the X-Files and to Millennium as well. So you had people like Kristen Cloak appearing in the X-Files and later Millennium. You had people like James Morrison appearing in Millennium, for example. You had people like, is it Rodney yeah. Rolls appearing in Never Again? Like this sense of like folding them in. And like with the seventh season of the X-Files, you get a sense of Carter doing the same thing for Millennium, where it's like, yep, yeah, Lance Henriksen is going to be our special guest star of the week. He's going to get like top billing in the guest cast. Um, but we're also going to like bring in Chip Johannesson, who ran the second half of the season of Millennium. And we're going to ask him to write an episode for us because he's part of the family. And like, Thomas J. Wright directed the hell out of Millennium for three years. So yeah, Beckett, yeah. he's he's going to be in and we're going to draft him onto the team. So I actually really like that aspect of it. Again, one of those like nice markers of 90s television production. Yeah. Also as well, I know we're, I know we're in the mailbag, but oh, it's sorry. just come to my head as something I was going to mention. No, this is me. Um, is that it's interesting how like during Millennium that you've got, we've seen this, we've seen this with Mulder in, in the episodes just preceding this, that we see the literal end of the world via his the the dream sequences in in that the uh, you know the kind of the um, the amorphous uh, the kind of like the last yeah, temptation of Mulder um, yeah, David Duchovny's kind Mulder. of like scripted sequences and again I yeah. I don't know if I'm appearing on that episode but I kind of want to because the production of that episode is bananas it's amazing um, <laughs> yeah. but we do get that and we get Frank here deciding uh, like basically to go with his daughter it's something that you know. Mulder's quest will soon become something slightly different as well. And it's interesting how you could have taken from the Millennium episode that, you know, Frank feels that his daughter takes precedent over what the Millennium group were doing and his, and his quest has changed and he wants to look after his daughter. And I just wonder how that relates to Mulder and his quest as well at this point, because as you say, with season seven coming to a close. Well, you have Sign Unseat they... and Closure coming up as well, yeah. which do similar stuff. Like there's a real sense of like drawing down the curtains. And again, like, you know, again, like, I'm not a huge fan of Millennium, the episode, but I, I do like that. And again, this is weird. This is a weird thing to praise it for, because like the TV show Millennium ended up with like Frank and Jordan going off into the sunset. So it's really weird to thank or to fe say, like, one thing I like about this episode is that it ends with Frank and Jordan going off into the sunset together when like the entire premise of the episode was dismantling the last time they went off into the sunset together. But I, I do yeah. like that sense of the curtain drawing down, a sense of like we're winding down. It's the end of things. Everybody gets an ending, maybe a happy ending, maybe a kind of a lay down your burdens ending, maybe a, like you just go on and the adventure continues ending. And I kind of like the sweetness of that, which, again, ties back into that stuff I was mentioning about, like Carter folding in people like Johannesson and Thomas J. Wright. It's like, yep, yeah, you guys helped me out. Uh, you guys did great work. You guys were rendered unemployed when Fox decided they weren't going to continue the show. I am going to make it a point to say, well, look, you're part of the family. Um, you mm. get to come back. You get to do this thing if you want. And I kind of like for all my cynicism and kind of all my criticisms of Millennium as an episode, I quite like the warmth of that idea. Like it's like yeah. we, we are one big happy family. Because, again, I think that's like Carter's talked about how for him, he would have happily wrapped up the X-Files after five years and moved on. But the reason why he stayed on, um, according to these interviews, was because he'd promised um, Anderson and Dukovny that he wouldn't leave them, that he wouldn't abandon them to another showrunner. And like, I think yeah. there's an AV Club interview uh, where they talk to him about this. It's very worth seeking out. And he's like, yep, yeah, I kind of like I stuck around because I made a promise to Anderson and Dukovny. And I said that, look. I wasn't going to leave them behind. So when Fox said, look, you can leave at the end of the fifth season if you want, but we are going to keep making the X-Files because we can. Carter was like, OK, fine, I'm going to stay. It's still going to be my show. So I like again, for all my criticism of Millennium, I like that familial aspect of it, if that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. No, I do. Yeah. And I think, um, as I say, I, th I think from a just from a thematic point of view that Mauler's quest is is you're never going to get the 2012 yeah. issue sorted because it's it's you know the the whole point is the is the journey to that not the not the event itself and i think that 
the way that Millennium dealt with it is like you know it's we'll, let's let, let's change it, let's move it around, let's keep it an emotional resonance for the daughter. Yeah. Uh, and as you say, Zana's like enclosure is a, is a perfect example moving into into the later into the season. That said, I am really looking forward to a point where Chris Carter like does the 2012 episode and the colonists just come up with like four hybrids that Mulder has to shoot in the head and like that's it. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that that now that that maybe that was the that was the third <laughs> film. Yeah. That's what the third film was. Yeah. Uh, Russell Hugo, Millennium could easily fit into the X Files and was even inspired by episodes such as Beyond the Sea, Irresistible, Paper Hearts. There are so many easy and interesting directions that were X Files appropriate that they could have gone uh, could have gone for. For example, the episode could have been played on the dynamic of Frank and Mulder's distinct um, emp- empathetic. I can't never say that word. I don't know why. Um, empathetic traits, um, a la Oubliette. Goodbye to all that was a far superior finale for the Millennium, and this adds nothing of substance to the Millennium story. On the other hand, this is a subpar X Files episode. It's not terrible television, but if it didn't exist, I wouldn't mind either. Thanks, Russell. Uh, Claire, uh, Kathy Glinsky says, um, I've never seen a, a, any of Millennium. I had never seen any of Millennium, the series, when I first saw the Millennium episode, so I didn't know who Frank Black was. I thought we were told enough to keep us interested in the episode, although I can understand if ma- Millennium fans were disappointed. The reunion with his daughter at the end didn't resonate with me emotionally, not knowing their story, and it seemed very awkward. And really, I just needed them to hurry up and leave because obviously <laughs> Mulder and Scully were, were going to kiss at midnight. <laughs> yeah, which is fair enough, Kathy. You know, I know I, I know Kathy well, so well, it's very much the energy of the scene. To be fair, like the, the, the scene isn't like hiding; it isn't playing any pretend. Like Scully, all but goes like Scully's like, "Oh, you aren't going to stick around for for kind of like New Year's," but in the way that's like, "Get out of the room! I need to make a move." <laughs> read the room frank go now yeah, yeah go now third wheel we um, should call you third wheel black you know um yeah um and i also they also got um dick clark to do some voiceover yes. work as well didn't they so and computer generated like the 2000 kind of like one of my it's, it's a really weird thing but the scheduling of this so like you would imagine watching this this would have been the last episode of the x-files to air before the turn of the millennium but no this broadcast november 28th 1999 and the last yeah. episode of the millennium was actually the goldberg variation which i think was the technically the second episode of the season to be shot which is remarkable to me yeah it's um it's all cause and effect Darren. it's all cause and effect <laughs> fair point uh, uh, liam shane coogan uh, said the postscript to one of the finest shows of all time thematically the balance tonally of the x-files universe Specifically, it's iconography and occasional horror tropes do jar a little with the grounded reality of Frank Bullock's world, at least as Chris Carter originally conceived it. However, the opportunity to allow Frank a final hurrah on the eve of the millennium itself proves to be the correct decision. For all its surface gloss, this is essentially a very simple zombie story played out with the panache and flair one has come to expect with the show at this point in its tenure. Taking the storyline in situ and applying it to uh, into the Millennium Universe can initially be problematic, but essentially, uh, but the essential notion that after the apocalyptic event, we will re- be reborn as undead echoes of ourself, slavishly gorging each other on a primal fight for survival, as touches on social Darwinism in it, and, and that stretch from media as diverse as Lord of the Flies to Rona Munro's debut Doctor Who story, Survival. As a sly commentary on how society would devolve, so to speak, in its bigotry, satiric notion on the part of Gilligan and Spotnitz. This episode proves as much of a coda to the world of Frank Black and his struggle as much as it does the original iteration of the Mulder Scully relationship. From here, the old world has gone and nothing will be quite the same again. But a show that was at this point facing accusations wrongly of having outlived its relevance, this is something to take uh, great pride in. The world didn't end. No more, it didn't. Now we all have to figure out what happens next. Art imitates lifer. And farewell to Frank Black. This is who you were. So there's interesting uh, things there on, on the state of play of the show, isn't it? I mean, we've discussed that briefly as it kind of like it, it's ramping down to season seven uh, and that it's um, it still has things to say. Uh, would you say that, that the X-Files would be in that situation? 
Well, I mean, it, it obviously does still have things to say. I mean, again, like I would argue that there are really, really great episodes in this season of television. I think that like X Cops as one of the best shows that the X Files ever did. I mean, even things like Thief are pretty good of themselves as well. I think Thief is mm. massively underrated as far as Monster of the Weeks go. I mean, I also really love Hollywood AD for my sins. Um, I know that it's a controversial and divisive episode, but I, I think it's a fascinating kind of study of where the show is at this point in history. And I would argue Requiem is fantastic it is arguably a perfect place to leave the x-files the only yeah. more perfect place to leave the x-files would be existence a year later yeah. which makes it somewhat more frustrating that neither of those managed to be the finale despite being the perfect finale for the show um yeah i mean i i do i kind of see that but i do also see the sense of fatigue that we talked about i do think that there is a real sense of a lot of people working on the show are exhausted like people don't tend to again this is one of the things about the production of television there's a reason why even many network shows these days only do eight ten or thirteen episodes in a season yeah. and sometimes take gap years in making shows like this it's because this grueling schedule is exhausting for absolutely everybody it wears you down um and i i think you can see that there and i accept that you know i'm maybe you know Maybe I'm being unfair. Maybe I'm being harsh. But I do think that you see that fatigue creeping into the seventh season. I don't think it's the worst season of the show. I certainly don't think that. Um, there are much worse seasons. But I also think that it lacks the energy of like three, four or five. And kind of like the, the, the boisterous kind of like rejuvenated form that it was in the early sixth as well. So I, yeah. I, I'm kind of hesitant to you know i don't entirely agree in terms of like the x-files kind of running forever or being able to run forever or having energy to continue for days but i i also don't want that to be misconstrued as saying oh it jumped the shark and it's terrible now because it's absolutely not there's a lot of yeah. really really great stuff here that deserves celebration praise and arguably even reappraisal i see we've managed to go through a full what an hour and 45 oh, sugar, minutes sorry. or so yeah. without without no without mentioning jump the shark <laughs> I tried to deliberately say, you know, there's another finale kind of thing to, uh, yeah, to another TV that show. That they wrapped in, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but you've mentioned Jump the Shark now, so I'm going to have to. Um, it is, so, yeah, Millennium no. is a better, more satisfying conclusion than Jump the Shark, <laughs> to be clear. Uh, I chose those words quite carefully. Um, yeah, yeah, I don't absolutely. think Millennium but, is Jump the Shark. No, no, it is not. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we'll leave Jump the Shark to another time. <laughs> Just for its episode, I think. Um, Cortland Waters Bartley says, I like it fine, but I think it seems odd to have it be a standalone episode. I have never seen Millennium, but I think all this world would have been better served as a two-parter to give the X-Files audience and characters a stronger hook into the story, leading it to a more emotionally resonant conclusion. Though admittedly, the timing would might have been awkward so soon after the three-parter. That's interesting. Because, uh, uh, you know, as we mentioned about the Jordan and Frank thing, um, whether or not that there wasn't enough resonance there, you mentioned potentially that it could be the way it's written or the fact that Britney Tip Lady just wasn't available to come down to LA. But increasing it to an hour and a half episode, what do you think to that? Part of me kind of thinks that, like, if that's the case, just make a Millennium TV movie if you can get away with it. Yeah. Um, I do wonder if there would, might have been a way, and again, this is something where it would probably be easier to do today on television because of how television works and how it's all serialized and how you can all stream it and it's designed for binge watching and stuff like that. But I do wonder if you could even just, like, have gotten away with seeding little elements, like accepting that you could only have Lance Henriksen for a single episode, accepting that he was only ever going to appear in one episode. Could you possibly have laid the groundwork, like, earlier in the season or in other episodes? Uh, could you possibly have had the Millennium Group be something that comes up before. And again, yes, Cortland's entirely right. This is the fourth episode of the season, and the first two are a two-parter, like dealing with the baggage inherited from the sixth season. So there's no way, as it is in the season, to do this. But I do wonder if you could have structured it slightly differently. Like, so you have a stretch of 
two more episodes before you get to the millennium so if you had like reshuffled some of them around and you'd found a way to instead of maybe doing the goldberg variation or rush or maybe like shuffling those later in the season maybe doing orison a little bit earlier and because he's a serial killer bring in the idea of the millennium group like and not even have it be a big deal but establish that the millennium group exists in this world establish who they are what they do maybe even establish a guest character who you can bring back in millennium in order to like tether the two episodes episodes together so that like millennium doesn't have to be both a gigantic exposition dump about the mythology of the show yeah. millennium and an introduction to frank black as a character and an x-files episode of itself and the episode where Mulder and scully finally kiss on screen so i think Cortland is on to something there i'm not entirely sure a two-parter structure would make it better um in that i get the sense that like if you expanded it to two episodes like the episode as it is, I suspect you'd end up with a lot more exposition, a lot more drag. But I do think that maybe if you could like scatter the groundwork that you need to do to get this to work across a few other episodes, maybe there's something there, you know? Mm-hmm. Again, like I like the idea of like Orison being written by Chip Johannesson and it being like, you know, Skinner being like, hey, there's a, a group here that they they work with law enforcement and we just like you to meet one of them and you know he can consult on this and maybe he gets brutally murdered at the end but it's like oh yeah I'm, I'm a millennium group member and it's like and then they're like frank black he was with the millennium group you know from that episode two episodes ago <laughs> right and it's just like yeah, yeah that's a bit easier that goes down a bit smoother you know yeah chris Knowles has been on now we spoke to chris Knowles on goodbye to all that on the season three finale he had a bit more to say about this episode then than he does here. Uh, he basically <laughs> says, I think it's a top tier episode. That is until it ends with Frank and Mulder shooting zombies in a basement. <laughs> Thanks, Chris. It's a fair <laughs> point. And it's a much more succinct yeah. way of summarizing the episode than we have, to be fair. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. That's all we need to say. Really. It was like, it's a good episode. It's not a bad episode until the end. Here, do, do we think that Millennium would be a better episode if it was just like first person shooter at the end? If it was like proper, like slow motion, gigantic guns and sunglasses and Frank Black and Mulder going like full 90s action movie on it instead of kind of like half hearted zombie apocalypse? No. <laughs> <laughs> uh, OK, so I'll move over to the other house now. So we're in the other house, the uh, Millennium podcast basement. The time is now basement um, equivalent. Uh, paycheck to say is Lance's was awesome. Seeing yeah. Britney was awesome. The story was way, way weak. All the uh, Millennium buildup amounted to guys in the basement yeah. and probably an unpopular um, opinion. But I thought the Midnight Kiss was weak. There was more intensity in the Fight the Future Near Kiss than that, uh, than that chase smooch at the end. So for me, an enormously disappointing cap on an amazing series and a perfunctory bland opening to focus in more on Scully and Mulder's personal relationship. That's why I never wanted to see it because they were unable to make it live up to the expectation or the expectation. Okay, thanks, nice. Paige. I would actually agree with that. I think that's a like I think that's that's a fundamental problem is that like Carter doesn't want to write that stuff and he isn't good at writing that stuff. So making yeah. it ambig like sorry, that's very mean. Carter I really like Carter as a writer. I've talked about how much I like Carter's kind of strengths as a writer, but he's not interested in like Mulder and Scully domestic drama. So asking him to write that I think is a losing proposition for everybody. So I think, yeah, keeping it ambiguous. I think Paige is right there. I think I would agree with Paige. Yeah. Jeff Carson says that uh, I think I was very glad it happened. Without it, there would have not been no send off at all. There still would have been about two hundred days remaining. That's interesting in itself because at least they are giving it some sort of closure to the point of that millennium's finished well earlier than the millennium. So at least they they were giving it some some kind of like extra curricular stuff to go on with. Yeah, I mean, again, like, I think we talked about this on on kind of like when we talked about like about all that and the question of like what we wanted from like the end of Millennium. And like the again, it's it's very similar to a, a dilemma that the X-Files is going to face. And you you alluded to this earlier as well. The yeah. the idea of what happens when the X-Files hits 2012, because since, um, you know, it's been implied since Talitha Kumi, but explicitly stated, I think, since the red and the black and like confirmed in, you know, the the truth like 2012 is the date of colonization it's supposed to begin it's like the deadline on the x-files as a show it's the same that the year 2000 was to millennium and it's like i i understand particularly coming at it from like an x-files fan perspective 
where 2012 hit and nothing happened and the show never brushed it off. It's like, oh, yeah, that was the uh, the start. That was that was what that was. It was a start date. And like, uh, turns out that these colonists are actually like contractors. So they're just going to take a little bit longer than they expected. Probably see it like finish in 100, 200 years. That's kind of like the, the target that we're setting at the moment. And I kind of like I understand why looking at that, you're like, OK, well, look. Four zombies in a basement is is kind of perhaps an underwhelming, like this is what the millennium was about, but at least it's something. At least it's like, yeah. at least it's a full stop. But part of me is also like, I, I really like that image of Frank and Jordan kind of driving off together at the end of Goodbye to all that. I felt yeah. like that was closure enough. And I feel like, and again, like, you know, I, I know I... I love the second half of the first season and I love the second season millennium there. Like those are 30 odd of my favorite episodes of television ever. I do think that the third season millennium, you know, I, I don't want to say that it's great television, but I do think it deserves a reappraisal. I do think it's treated rather harshly in the consensus on the show. I think the first half is a mess. I think the second half is unfocused, but interesting and bold. And what I will say about the end of the third season is that it is very careful to make it clear. And you kind of suggested this earlier on, and it's, it's worth just reiterating in, in, in this discussion. But the end of the third season made the point that the millennium is not necessarily about the end of the world. It's not about the apocalypse. It's not about, you know, as the end of the second season, spoiler alert, suggests that maybe it's the end of all human civilization. The third season very cleverly said, no, it's a point in time where mankind chooses the future that they want to have. And the apocalypse or the end of the world is the destruction of every other possibility apart from the one that we follow. And that was vague enough and spiritual enough and existential enough for me that I personally, and this is this is just me, I want to stress this is just me, but I didn't feel the need to see anything more on screen, if that makes sense. It wasn't yeah. it wasn't like on and like in the truth where Mulder sees the date like 2012 and it's like alien invasion happens and it's like oh my god it's gonna be like like Amor Fati two episodes earlier promised like you're gonna see ships in the sky you're gonna see the world destroyed you're gonna see like takeover and all that sort of stuff like the X-Files like the X-Files 2012 date is a big date and something explicit is going to happen there because that's how the mythology of the X-Files works and sorry I, yeah. I know we've talked long enough and I apologize to listeners for going on again but like for me the big difference between Millennium and the X-Files is that like the conspiracy on the X-Files is very grounded. And I know the joke is like, oh, it didn't really make sense or it doesn't really cohere. Or it doesn't really come together. But the X-Files conspiracy, you know, does largely make sense. A, B, C, D. You understand who the conspirators are. You understand what they want. You understand what they're working towards. You know, sure, things are called things like purity, for example. But you know what that is. That is a defined physical object. Whereas Millennium was always more abstract. It was always more, um, you know, sort of esoteric, more weird, more eccentric and less concrete. So, mm -hmm. like, again, I think Millennium got away with not showing us what the would have gotten away with not showing us what the Millennium represented. And personally, I wonder if that might have been stronger than have you got a gun? Yeah, um, <laughs> let's blast some zombies uh, in, in this episode. But again, this is, I accept this is just me personally, uh, but I do wonder, like, yeah. I might have been happier leaving it ambiguous or open. Um, being I, I think, uh, I think uh, I didn't need it. It was nice to yeah, have, but yeah, I didn't yeah, need that's it. Fair. I think that's probably the way I, way I approach it. So just a couple more. So Carl Nia, the episode works more or less like an X-Files episode, but not so much as a Millennium one. And it would have been nice to have Mulder and Frank work together yeah. more as they did in the Millennium comics. Yes. Now, at scheduled at the moment, I believe that you and Tony are going to talk about the Millennium Comics. We are indeed uh, in in a, in a future episode. So, and that's on the time is now. So we might, as I say, you know, as a, another crossover for those people interested in Mulder's story, because Mulder does appear in those comics. I haven't read them personally, but uh, he does um, feature quite heavily in them, doesn't he? He does, and it, it's a very clever thing. And I actually think the combination of Mulder and Frank Black is much better there than it is here because it plays off in a in a much more organic way that makes sense as the two of them as profilers. Because again, like, I, and I know, I'm sorry I keep coming back to it, but it's like we have two iconic forensic profilers, two characters who define male FBI agents in 90s media. We're going to throw them together on screen for the first time and what are they going to do? They're going to blast zombies. And it's like, 
like yeah. blasting zombies is a big deal even for Mulder. Like it's it's not like a regular accepting that things like you know the second season Fresh Bones exist. You know, like blasting mm. zombies isn't part of Mulder's regular job description, and it's not certainly not part of Frank's regular <laughs> job description. So it's like it's a really weird shared interest for Millennium to kind of focus on. Whereas the comics do, I actually, and it's been a while since I've read them. I haven't read them yet for that episode, but I remember reading them and thinking. Yes, this actually makes sense as a character study of the two. It understands who Mulder is, who Frank is, how they relate to one another, how they're different from one another, and the kind of situation you need to put them in in order to emphasize those similarities and those differences in a way that works for both characters. So, yeah, I I remember quite liking the comics. I feel terrible now because it's probably I'm probably going to read and go, "Wait, what? What did I?" Say? <laughs> but I did enjoy well, no, them no, when I was Let's keep the fans, um, you know, on tender hooks yeah, so that they can listen into li- listen to that episode. Because I'll be li- I'll be reading those comics probably the first for the first time Ooh. before listening to the episodes. So that'd be good. Um, he also goes on to say, Carl Neal goes on to say, so while it was nice to have some sort of closure as weak it was as it was for the Millennium Group, uh, I like how they snuck in the moment for all for all those MSR shippers. Um, and oh well, the, the world didn't end. So he basically goes on to say about that. And then finally, I want to mention Michael John Petty, who's uh, been a collaborator on The Time Is Now, and I'm hoping to get him on to an X-File one in the future. Um, He says that although it's not a fitting end to Millennium, uh, it's at the very least, it brings back a fan favourite in Frank Black. Unfortunately, that's the most of it, as as the episode is no way feels like a Millennium episode. It does make for a great X-File, however, giving fans that much-anticipated kiss. While it is easy to be disillusioned by the way this episode is executed, I will say that seeing Frank and Mulder interact was a dream come true. And Frank's reunion with Jordan is a heartfelt moment that almost makes the journey feel worth it. At least at the end of the Millennium's run, we know that they are together again. The biblical elements of this episode are also interesting, though, like I said before, feel more like an X-File than something we would have seen at least explicitly on Millennium. Any thoughts on that? No, I think I think that's all fair. Um, like I, I, I mean, you probably kind of like again. It's worth it's worth pointing out the second season of Millennium does get the second and third season of Millennium both get very weird, and even the first season you have episodes like say Force Majeure, for example, um, and Maranatha as well. So like you could probably do a version of this episode on Millennium, but it would be. It would probably not end with the characters blasting zombies in a basement. Which I, get, I love, <laughs> I love, I love that. that I keep using those words. It's like a really great blasting zombies in a basement. But yeah, no, I, I kind of like, I can see that. I think, I think I agree with that point, broadly speaking. Excellent. Well, that draws the episode to a close. It's been a long one. I knew Sorry this was going that, to be guys. long. Purely, purely because of the subject matter. In fact, we're talking about two shows, effectively, and trying to keep it entertaining for those people who haven't watched Millennium. <laughs> Uh, we didn't talk about Peter Watts or anything like that, which is great. So I mean, we talked about Terry O'Quinn. We did, Mr. 1013. It's 1013. Um, so if people are wanting more of you, if they haven't had enough of you already, Darren. <laughs> in, um, this well, <laughs> in this monster-sized portion. And this in this monster-sized portion, even if I wanted to take a few weeks away, where can people find you online? Because you're listening to this on two feeds, I can't actually tell you exactly what I'll be doing, but I can tell you where you can find me. So I'm on Twitter at Darren underscore Mooney, where I'm constantly complaining about movies. I'm not actually complaining that much and talking about comics and, and film and television, other things that kind of interest me and just randomly dicking about. So if you want to engage with me there, please feel free. I'm, I'm always glad when somebody pops up and says hello. Um, outside that, I write at the movie blog, uh, which is my own blog. That's with a zero instead of an O because I didn't register it quick enough. God damn it. I missed that dot com gold rush. Um, I also write for the Escapist magazine. Um, and you can find that with uh, escapismagazine.com. I do a couple of columns there, so twice a week. So I write on Fridays, I write on Mondays about pop culture. Um, I also do a podcast there, and I do a video series called In the Frame with a wonderful guy called Omar Ahmed. Uh, you can find those on YouTube. I'm really, really proud of those, um, in large part because they're they're very good, um, and they're very good because Omar is a fantastic video editor. Um, like, I, I'm constantly blown away when I actually get to see them and see what he's done. I'm like, yep, turn off the sound, get that stupid guy's voice out of your head and just watch them because they're really really stunning video essays and i'm just glad to be a a part of that i'm glad to work with omar on those so you can find all of those with a google i also co-host a podcast with my good friend andrew quinn kurt has been a guest on it in the past i think you talked about um the truman show um and you talked about something else shutter island Island as well yeah yeah. and we do need to get you back on to talk about memento soon enough actually i think we've done another chris nolan film recently but we will hopefully have you back on to talk about memento sooner yeah it's it's 20th year this year 
it has indeed. So we're hoping to have, we don't see this is the great thing. Maybe if you're on the Xcast feed, <laughs> this episode will already <laughs> be out. But yeah, I'm really, really looking forward to that. So you can find it's that's called the 250. We're on Twitter, SoundCloud, iTunes, wherever good podcasts are sold. So feel free to give us a kind of a search there. Cheers. Excellent. Well, this is my final ever episode speaking about Frank Black. So I want to thank you everyone on, on the time is now who's uh, who's followed me on that journey over there. Um, it's not my final journey on the X cast, obviously we'll be going later into the season, but, um, but yeah, uh, it's been, it's been great pleasure speaking about Frank Black and a great little, uh, addendum to, uh, to, to the, to his story here. So thank you for that. Um, but you can find me on Twitter at R Muldrake. That's R M U L D R A K E. You can also find me over on the Red Dwarf podcast, Shipwrecked and Comatose. And you can find that at Red Dwarf pod where we're co- currently going through, all of the seasons with various different specials. So God knows where we'll be when you read this or hear this. So yeah, so those are the best two places to get me. Um, also, there will be Star Trek Picard stuff going on as well. I'm on the Make It So podcast and you can find that at Jean-Luc Podard. So those are the three best ones to find me on. But obviously you'll hear me later on in the X-Cast and I will be doing another episode of the Legacy of Millennium. Hopefully scheduled with Tony. In, in in future weeks just to to wrap up our coverage of millennium over over on that show so yeah so it's been a it's been a, a tight rope to walk across the, across on this one having two um two podcasts but recording once and also being on a patreon feed and also being on the xcast feed and being on the time is now feed it's all a bit yeah. kind of meta I, I should say by the way thank you for having me on actually like i know you you've done all of this you've done a phenomenal job with the time is now and stuff i'm just really glad that i was able to do a lot of that or a portion of that with you uh, talk, revisiting millennium yeah. has been a delight and a pleasure and an honor and i've been flattered to do it and i've been very glad to do it with you and i've been very glad to do it with all of you too listeners he says smile you can imagine <laughs> i'm smiling as i say it, but no i am I'm really really great to yeah. have the opportunity to revisit the show because uh, it is one of my favorites so thank you the fact that the time is now has given me an opportunity to review the uh, the show and to get up different aspects of uh, people's opinions and different viewpoints has been great purely because um, i only rewatched it late uh, lately in the last like four last four or five years and i think because of that that's why tony was aware that i was such a fan of it and to be able to then go back into it not long after that rewatch has been really good. So I've really enjoyed that. And no doubt we'll talk about more in the legacy. As I say, you've got the next episode should be the Millennium in Comics that you'll hear after Ooh. this. The time is now, people. So, Darren, you're not quite finished yet. You get to speak to Tony. Uh, just uh, just if, if um, don't tell me if Lucy Butler appears in the <laughs> comics. Just say that she does. And then I'll, and I'll definitely read them. <laughs> so, um, so, yeah, so that leaves us to, to finish. So uh, thank you, everyone, for listening. And until next time, trust no one. Elsewhere on We Made This. Shipwrecked and Comatose, a Red Dwarf podcast. We are doing something even crazier than usual. We are doing seven episodes in seven days. Which lunatics are joining me in this journey? First up, hello, Carl. Hello. How are you doing there, everyone? And also, hello, Colin. All right. <laughs> so what we've decided we're going to do is rather than do one episode covering the magazines, we're going to do the first seven issues one by one, episode by episode, day by day, for an entire f-ing week. It will either be brilliant or sh. <laughs> I like how we're phrasing it. We've gone crazy. Do you know what we're going to do? We're going to do some reading. Movie Palace. Okay, let's let's dive in then. Let's talk now, Voyager. There's quite a lot to talk about with this film, actually. Um, I just wanted to ask you both, first of all, sort of any interesting personal history with the film. Like, Clara, I know a lot of these films we've talked about in the past, the films that you've seen as a child and, you know, as a younger person. Is, this, is it the case with this one, too? Yes, definitely. I saw this as a kid. I don't think I quite understood it when I first saw it. I think I thought it was a, a romantic film. I don't think I really picked up on the mental illness and the sort of abuse. We buy records. Tim, it was record store day. I was going to say there's an elephant in the room. Uh, I don't Ooh. think we have mentioned it yet in this episode, have we? I wonder if some people thought that we were going to be ice cool and not even mention record store day. Uh, well, we are. We're doing it now. Yeah. 
Check out all of these shows and more on the We Made This Podcast Network. The X-Cast and X-Files podcast was created by Tony Black and is produced and hosted by Carl Sweeney, Sarah Blair and Kurt North. You can find the podcast on Twitter at the X underscore cast, on Facebook by typing in the X-Cast and in our group X-Files Basement, the X-Cast podcast fan group and on Instagram at the X-Cast pod. Don't forget, you can support the show by becoming a member on Patreon. Our patrons get early access to episodes, behind the scenes chats with our hosts and a thriving community of X-Files, and other premium interviews and specials. To find out more and subscribe, you can go to patreon.com slash the xcast. That's p-a-t-r-e-o-n dot com slash the xcast. We are also part of the We Made This Podcast Network, full of popular culture shows, including our Millennium series, The Time Is Now. You can find all of our shows at our website, wemadethispod.com, or via Twitter at wemadethispod.com. Thanks for listening and keep watching the skies. Mm-hmm.